Sim, não, não vai ter cor. That's the same one here. Yeah. Okay. Can you miss it? No. Is that one? Is that one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's call this meeting of CPDC to order. Um. So we have an agenda, uh, but I think we're going to diverge from the agenda um, immediately. Um, I do understand before we get any items that we have public comment, on, um, not necessarily addressing anything particular on the agenda, or maybe so. Do you, do you want to? Thank you, John. Yes, uh, potential zoning bylaw amendments. I guess we throw it under there, but I can't stay for the whole meeting. Oh, okay. I thought you. Were and Tony had mentioned you were going to be taking that out of order. So, but I have two things I want to mention to the CPDC. I have talked about one of these things in a little bit to the board of selectmen, uh, the select board rather. Um, not that I expect any immediate action, of course, but I would like the CPDC to consider modifying its subdivision bylaws or regulations or whatever it's called, uh, or begin to talk about not allowing clear cutting of these subdivisions when houses are built. I think it's way past time that we allow developers or builders to come in and just cut down every tree on site in order to erect their buildings. I mean, there's some trees that are large that provide a lot of uh, shelter, and we know all the good things about trees. Um, and it's just, it's too stark when I see these, you know, development. We're just too late. We're losing too much tree cover, and I see the one veterans way up off Main Street, North Main Street, whatever the name of the one is off of, uh, Lowell Street. I mean, it's just a shame to see these uh, lots just stripped of everything. Um, so I'd like to present that to you for your consideration this coming year. Um, the second thing is a modification. Um, so my name is Mary Ellen O'Neill. Oh. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm a long time, uh, thank you, town meeting member. And the other thing I would like the um, CPDC to consider is a modification of the 40R um, zoning. Um, you know, bylaw to um, provide for some setback, for some green. It, if we end up with buildings that look like the one that's on the Sunoco site all the way up Main Street, we're going to be very sorry. Um, it's just too dense, it's too overpowering, we're going to feel extremely claustrophobic if we haven't allowed for some green, at least a, a modest strip um, along the sidewalk. Um, trees, just the street trees alone won't be enough and uh, to provide that sense of kind of space and whatever we're looking for. But I'm looking for something that doesn't look so harsh because we still want to be kind of a town to the extent that we can despite all the growth. Um, and I think that would uh, would help out. And I think there's a lot of people that are kind of interested in seeing that, that we not allow 100% lot coverage in the 40R. So thank you very much. Right. I appreciate your time. I think there's some other things we're going to take out of order, correct? Um, the uh, A&R plan for 104 Salem Street? Yeah, we have is that, that, and then we have um, documents for the Lynetta Lane subdivision, okay. which is being transferred from one developer to another. Okay. Um, the Lynetta Lane representatives are, are here, as well as the attorney for 104 Salem. All right, let's take 104 Salem. Okay. Um, So do we have, uh, right, we have a, um, uh, we have a memo from, 
from Julie. Yep. Um, and did we get feedback from engineering? Yeah, there's no concern. But All right. Yeah. It meets the uh, requirements the for requirement an requirement for an ANR. corner of Salem and Pearl Street. Um, any questions? No questions, but I have a comment. Since we're really only allowed to comment on, we're really, really only approving one thing, but right? really endorsing one aspect. One aspect. Of the adequacy of the way, right? Yeah, which is the only thing we can comment on. But personally, I can comment on the fact that people will run out to a meeting when some developer comes in and wants to put a 40B bypass zoning, but when there's a little subtle attempt to do it, you know, nobody comes out to yell at those. So, well, I come up with a good word for it. Zoning is in place for a reason. Well, Julie, I was reviewing the state's A&R handbook. Am I correct in the assumption that the only freeze for three years is for use and not for um, dimensional controls? I believe it pertains to all aspects of zoning, but we have an attorney here who can speak to that. Would it cover just use or would it call all? It depends on what the dimensional control is and the effect it has on what you're doing. Okay. But it definitely freezes use. So I am assuming that the the applicant is planning on converting the house to a two-family under the existing footnote one, well, trying to use the existing footnote one in preparation for the changes that may come at the next uh, town meeting. But the changes that are coming at the next town meeting are nothing more than a clarification of the rules applying to the footnote one, which is that the house still has to be uh, look like a single family. I guess the only change here would be the size of the addition to the building, where currently there is no limitation on an increase to the building size under footnote one. No? I think you're misinterpreting what's happening here. Not that we're, we're it's not within our purview to discuss, but they're, they're saying it's partially raised and relocated. They're looking to make two lots. Move one, build another. Maybe I can give some insight. Might be I don't just, want any insight. Well, I'm happy to for clarification that. purposes because that's not what we're intending to do. Okay. We'll see what happens in four years. I mean, we're, we're working with the building department. We're working with the planning department. We get caught, kind of caught in the middle of this bylaw change, and we're not looking to. We're just looking to be able to not be caught in the middle of that. But we are going to, within the spirit of what's happening, a good part of that house is going to be saved. Not looking to take the whole thing down or anything like that. Why right. split the lot then? The zoning freeze. So I, I would like to go back to your question or your comment about them trying to create two lots here. I, and can you explain more about why you're concerned about that? Uh, yeah, because it's a S15. They have a 21,000 plus square foot lot. Right. What they to do is conform to the footnote. I don't see it changes anything other than creating two lots. I think you should explain, Brian. What am I missing? Well, it freezes the zoning. The, the, new, the new bylaw that you're referring to is a special permit process, which the current bylaw isn't. So it changes the dynamics of how one goes about the process. You split the lot. But, but what, what, what the a and plan provides is it provides a zoning freeze. That's what it does. Because you take an action on the lot. Correct, and it doesn't matter what you do with that lot in the future. That plan, that plan doesn't even have to be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to obtain the zoning freeze. By your endorsement on it, it freezes the zoning on that entire lot in existence today. That's what it does. So. So my 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 strong guess would be that you will not see that plan recorded at the Registry of Deeds. I would think it would be highly unlikely. 
able to obtain variances after the fact like that. So she started getting pieces from the other laws. Not to mention that there are other aspects in which that plant does not conform to zoning. So there may be multiple variances. Isn't the new zoning more advantageous? Didn't we just clear up what they really could do? I'm not going to speak to what the applicant finds no, advantageous. No, no. What's the zoning? The right. issue we were having with that particular piece of zoning. We, I think from an administration standpoint, find it more advantageous, yes. But I mean, the, I think there's a fear that on the floor of town meeting, things can change. Um, right? And so they're trying to, they like what the bylaw says today, and they're trying to freeze that in place so they can work out. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's good to be skeptical. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't change how I have to vote on it, so it doesn't matter. No. Yeah. But that's my position on it. Other comments? Do we vote to endorse or do we just endorse? Because. Do both. Um, I think we've always. Made a motion to yeah. endorse. Isn't that the motion? <sighs> Sorry, the motion to endorse. I don't know what I'm endorsing. Approval not required plan yeah. yep. for 104 Salem Street. Second. Second. All those in favor? <laughs> so there's two copies of it and they're on the back table. Okay. How many signatures do you need? Three. I'll go sign. Tony Count as a signing member? He can, uh, yeah, he can sign. Okay. Thank you for double checking. <laughs> Um, so what's the next, what, what else do we have? So, the Lynetta Lane subdivision, um, oh. which is the subdivision, it's, I believe, six lots off of Franklin Street, across from Wood End Cemetery. It was approved in the fall of 2017. Um, construction is underway. We have the original developer built here. Um, he can kind of explain more background and answer any questions you have. And then we have the new developer who's looking to purchase the remainder of the project. And so we have some documents um, that we need to basically have a new form agent and form K, which is the form H is the covenant and form K is the primary agreement. So we need to establish the new covenant and the new bond and then release the old, the old covenant okay. and the old bond. Okay. Um, and so I have the paperwork here because right. we just have one copy of everything. Was there a uh, bond reduction for that? Yes. So um, engineering reviewed what's left to do at the site and came up with a new number, which is the number that the new developer wanted. And I have all that documentation and it was all uploaded. Um, so. So the. The, the new number was developed by engineering or worked there? Everyone's in agreement on that new number? Yeah. Everyone's in agreement yeah. on okay. that number. And um, the, the agreement, is that right? That's pretty standard. I mean, it's the same that tri-party agreement on yeah. those. It's we, same. It's the same type of agreement. I mean, there's a few different types of surety, but I think this board, at least in my time here, has most commonly seen the tri-party agreement form of surety um, for some engines. But it covers the same thing, everything, the same things as the last one. Yes, yes. Um, so here's the new covenant. I need three signatures, um, and also we'll, if you'll take a vote as well. All right. Um, I missed it. I apologize, Julie. Where does the money go? So we're establishing a new Form H, which is the covenant for the subdivision, and mm -hmm. a new Form K, which is the tri-party agreement for the new developer. 
and then we'll release the form H and the form K from the original developer. So the money follows the forms? The money follows the forms, I guess you could say that. Um, but they might be using different banks, so. But basically the town's going to return X amount of dollars and get X amount of dollars back. We're releasing X amount of dollars. Well, we're, we're getting X amount of dollars bonded and then we're releasing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Bonded. Yeah. Okay. Um, other questions? Do you want to, here's the, um, <coughs> it was on the drive. I don't know if you guys looked at it. Um, yeah. So. Here's the new form K. So we should vote on the, um, Tony, you have a new agreement. So vote on the new agreement and then we'll okay. try approved yeah. first. I'm sorry, any other questions on this? No. Yeah. Straightforward. Right. Uh, move that we are endorsing the form Endorsed. H and the form K. Form H and Form K for Lanetta Lane subdivision. Second. Second. All those in favor? Right. You guys can sign that. Did you get the third? It's just getting this last page first. Oh, no. I'm sorry. signatures are three. No, three is enough. Okay. Um, and then so. That's my pen and it comes from <laughs> <laughs> I was good. So great. That's lovely. <laughs> so we have a request for you to take a vote to release the original covenant. Um, and a request where we just need a vote for you to release the original bond. And then I basically record them right. on the farm. You don't have to sign it. First one again. So releasing the covenant and releasing the bond for the original developer, uh, SNL Homes. SNL. Again, tell me when I gotta take notes for this. All right. Um, motion to vote to release the covenant and the bond for the original developer's SNL Homes. Homes. Thank you. That would be two votes. Um, I think it's fine if you Second. just do it together. Second. All those in favor? Um, so I have to have these forms notarized tomorrow, and then I'll email you and let you know you can come through the Okay. Is that? Yep. So. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank Thanks. You. To the closing. All right. Um. So, continue on to Yeah. Um. Can we take them down? Does it matter if we? Should I 
the continuances? Does it matter whether I... Uh, you can do it now, and then if anyone shows up... Yep. All right. Um, but do we really... Do we, do we do that every time? Vote to... Uh, I think so. Well, then if anyone's watching at home, yep. waiting to come, we'll yep. know. Um, so we have, um, moving back to our agenda, our jumbled up agenda again, um, uh, for 8 o'clock, we have on the agenda um, uh, 135, 139, and 149 Howard Street, um, uh, definitive subdivision plan. The applicant has requested that we continue that to November 4th. Um, Second. Yeah. All those in favor? Uh, mm -hmm. um, do we, yeah, do we want it? Uh, it's not needed. Yeah, I can see okay. it's coming. Yeah, okay, so maybe 8 o'clock. So that will be November 4th at 8 p.m. Uh, other item on our agenda, um, 258, 262 Main Street. Uh, Reading CRE, CRE Ventures, uh, they also have requested that we continue to November 4th, and that would be at 8.15. Mm -hmm. Second. All those in favor? All right. Um, now getting back on track with our agenda. <laughs> Uh, discussion of potential zoning bylaw amendments for 2020. Yes, and I'm very yeah. excited because I can introduce you tonight to our new economic development director, Erin oh, Schaefer. She's been on board since mid-June, I believe. Um, and we are really rocking and rolling and getting things done. And uh, we're the dream team here in Reading. <laughs> so I don't know if, Erin, you, you want to say a few words about yourself or... Sure. Um, have any specific questions? Yeah. I'm Erin Schaefer. Um, I was a staff planner and staff the Zoning Board of Appeals and Planning Board in Salem for a number of years. And I moved on to Danvers where I served as a conservation agent for a little while before this job as an economic development director. And so I'm coming with a great number of experiences and I also uh, sit in your shoes in my hometown in Salem. I'm on the Historic Commission. so. Familiar with serving on boards and commissions and also staffing boards and commissions. So, um, anyway, I bring a level of technical experience um, to the town, which I think is helpful for this team here and to all of you. And I'm really excited to keep plugging along on the economic development action plan. That's primarily why I'm here. And I'm working on a number of major uh, large scale initiatives as well as some small scale initiatives as well with this team. So, so um, as we are proceeding with our discussion on um, you know potential changes to the use table and I told Erin to kind of like interject if she sees ways she can be helpful to our conversation um, so so um, I guess before we jump into that um, I'm gonna maybe Julie and I can talk about this um, uh, but but uh, in terms of timing but uh, um, I'm going to I'm going to suggest that you come uh, every once in a while. Maybe you know if if for some reason you don't happen to come for a particular item, um, maybe if we can have you on the agenda, um, uh, you know every I'm going to say every at least every six months. Yeah, um, definitely. You know maybe every 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 four or so. Um, just because a lot of the things that we do um, sort of interact with with what you're doing, we're in you know we're in contact um, uh, with planning folks directly on a regular basis. But I think we need, we need to make sure that we have some um, sort of some interaction here between you and this the the whole board. By trade, <laughs> I'm a I'm a planner, so I, I wear the hat of planning, but I am happen to be specialized here in it. Um, but I, my interest is really in zoning um, and kind of a policy walk in that way. Uh, so uh, 
I'm really looking forward to further discussion about zoning and policy changes that will hopefully bring not only support to existing businesses and um, further investment now, but also future private investment. And, um, we're actively working with a variety of businesses who are looking to move to town. Um, so I think you know the decisions of this board and the decisions of the select board need to be informed, and that's our job to provide you some really detailed information, ask all you know, answer all of your questions. Um, but just know that your decisions are very impactful, as you know. Um, I think that's a really important thing. Um, that I guess I'll, I'll close in saying that I, I do, I also agree that right, there's a lot of things that we do that impact economic development and, um, and, um, and having some feedback from you, which is why I think that it would be helpful for you to come every once in a while. Um, it, um, feedback from you that we may, that you may get different than, than we, when we talk to, you know, sort of the general public, um, so that we know those sorts of things that government can do um, to affect economic um, development. There's a lot of outside forces that we have no control over, but there's certain things that we can do, um, uh, or sometimes we do by accident um, <laughs> that impact you know negatively or sometimes positively. But um, hopefully that you have your ear to that and we'll be able to share it so that we can make. Um, I guess say informed, more informed decisions. So. And Aaron, if you want to sit up here, we have two open seats, no pressure. Up, up here. If you if you can hear better and see better, and sure, thank you. Sure. So, um, moving on, uh, table of uses and sign bylaw. Um, so. Um, do you, well, do you have thoughts? Sure. On yeah. How to proceed or orders or? Well, you can choose the order, but I can. Um, so you know, as we talked about last time, um, and and other times, you know, at other meetings, it seems that the table of uses is right for uh, a reason. Um, either you know, structurally, um, you know, category-wise, and um, things we allow, and then also you know adding additional uses to kind of bring it into sort of this new era that we're in. Um, and then regarding the sign bylaw, you know, I had mentioned last time in probably prior meetings that, you know, we keep tripping over some certain sections of it um, at the staff level. And so, you know, what I was thinking was that rather than doing an overhaul of the sign bylaw, which I know seems like a daunting kind of undertaking, um, maybe some surgical fixes to kind of do away with a few of the things or reword a few of the areas that we um, that we see, um, you know, either just like rampant disregard for and they're, you know, things that become an enforcement nightmare um, or just some things that we think are really like um, creating a challenge for businesses um, when they're trying to come into town and put up signage. And, um, so, I don't personally have a preference where you start, whether you want to start with uses or start with design uses. Um, and it's all at this early stage, of course, like food for thought. Yes. Conversations starting. Um, ideas. Um, well, I, I'm going to suggest maybe we start with the sign bylaw. Okay. Um, I, oddly enough, I think that might be a, a more pointed um, um, discussion. Sure. Is right. There's, as you said, there's specific things right. that um, that you all are um, having troubles with. Right. Two. So, what do you think the best way to go about this is? So we could start by going through. Um, you know, page one and going through the comments in order, bless you. Um, there are, you know, that, that being said, there are some surgical fixes, and then I do have some comments in here about, um, as I was reading through it, like, you know, what is meant here? Yeah. Does this make sense? Okay. Let's clarify this. So, it's, so it did expand a little bit beyond just, like, the few areas that we have ongoing problems with. So the idea during tonight is, right, to, to I think, 
right? Not to get down and necessarily solve any one of these particular issues, but to get a good idea of what we're up, I can say, up against um, and what's on the table, and we can at least get a, a gauge of where we think the effort is and right. where we might get hung up. Right. Okay. Um, so if we want to start with the first comment, what are you seeing a different one? Mm -hmm. oh. Can you give us the context? I mean, if we, Julie? Yep. Sure. Before we kind of dive into each item one at sure. a time, can you give us some of the context of the places you're the finding challenges and instances and examples? And yeah, sure. Places? So, um, like the short list is window signage, A-frame signage, um, upper floor signage, um, and then just in general, like allowing a little bit more flexibility with regards to, um, well, and what am I trying to say? Some places where, um, where enforcement is tough because the yeah, I think like encouraging a master signage plan in like uh, more often than not could be helpful, um, and and allowing a little more flexibility in what businesses can do when they come in for a master signage plan, or what building owners can do. Um, so, did you have any specific other things? I don't think so. A lot of times we see the businesses want directory signs, freestanding signs, wall signs, and of course they can't have them all, but there's ways that we can help get a good product for them while maintaining what we want to, so that's kind of our goal here. Right, and then we have like um, a lot of areas where we really dig, delve in deep, like the window signage. We have an overall requirement. We have a letter height requirement. We have um, a requirement for how it is supposed to look and on what side of the glass it's supposed to be, and, and signs that are vi viewable from outside the window. What they like, so we're just really getting into the nitty gritty with that. And um, there's nothing like inherently wrong with that. It's just that it's. Um, it's almost impossible for a business to completely, they unwittingly don't comply um, oftentimes. And then we um, don't know, we aren't always aware until we hear about it. And then it, and then if we enforce it in one business, we need to enforce it in all. And, and so it's just a kind of like a snowball effect. Um, and so the question I would pose to you is like, what are you getting at and what really matters, right? Um, and is there anything in here that we could maybe get rid of? Well, you said two things when you started off. You said there are areas where you're having trouble. Mm -hmm. um, staff is having trouble. And then you said there are areas where there's blatant disregard. And right. I don't know that I want to zone because right, no. some business owner thinks they know better. Right. But I do think trying to meet, like, like thinking about it from the lens of like, it's happening and it's blatantly disregarding the zoning bylaw. But is it that bad? Do we do we want to meet them in the middle? On some cases, do we want to establish a process for it? Like, for example, A frames in business A. Currently, we only allow A frames in business B on the public sidewalk with a license from the select board. But there are a number of businesses in, in business A that put them up on their own private property. Um, and so th there, that's a little bit of a gray area because we do allow each private property in town to have one temporary sign. And if they're under a certain size, the A-frames, then it could qualify as that. But we we hear from people, you know, that that we should be enforcing that because A-frames technically aren't allowed um, in business A. On the public way. Well, or actually at all. Actually. actually at all. No, because... I'm allowed a, I'm allowed a sign, right? So there's Very two fine. ways you can interpret the bylaw. You can look at it and it says clearly A-frames are not allowed in business A, and you can also look at it and we allow one temporary sign on every lot, and that could include an A-frame. Right. So that's something that we should clarify. Um, and I'm allowed a two-sided temporary sign, whether I spike it into the soil and on my side of the property line or whether it's supported right. like that. 
as opposed to like that. But we get a lot of complaints about the proliferation of A-frames around town. Sure. Um, the, okay, so when people look at the zoning by law, they, they read it that way, that we allow it. Um, so, what's that? That's an easy clarification. Yeah. So, how do you want to, do you want to just start at the top? And sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the first comment I made, so, so some, in so, like I mentioned in some places, my comments and my suggestions are, um, you know, not necessarily hearkening back to our three or four major issues. Yeah. But um, so on page eight, um, where we authorize signs and we authorize original art displays, I added including murals. Um, Yeah, it, there was a thing that came up with murals a while ago. Yeah, was, yeah. If you painted what you were doing in the store, mm -hmm. then they it's were a interpreting sign. it yeah. as a sign. Right. Yeah. But really, you know, is that really accurate? Because the butcher shop painted like a fish shop, and the butcher shop's not there anymore, anyways. So right. even if they had painted a butcher shop, what now, yeah, now, yeah, now that thing would be, uh, well, yeah. And so technically, some, we're not supposed to look at the content. Like, right. if we are going to regulate it as a sign, right? Right, yeah, but it, right, and that was that, that was pre that whole discussion was pre um, pre Supreme, Supreme Court. Court, yes. Right. <clears throat> but I think that we would have some decent artwork, decent displays, really, if we let them paint that butcher shop in there. But they didn't put their name there. I don't see what the problem would have been with that. Right. So the question I think really is, and I, I uh, um, is. What's the definition of original art display? Yeah, so I was just looking at that. Um, so it's a work of fine art. It's on page four in the middle. A work of fine art that is displayed in conjunction with a commercial enterprise with the permission of the property owner, but for which the commercial enterprise does not receive direct commercial gain. An original art display does not include mechanically produced or computer generated prints or images, including but not limited to digitally printed vinyl, electrical or mechanical components, or changing image art display. So we say what it's not. So, Gold's Gem, for example, mm -hmm. is exactly not that. It's exactly what it's not supposed to be. This is a sticker, right? This is like a poster. Oh, so yeah. The print of yes, people yeah. working yes. out. And those are their window signs, which should be taking up no more than. Are you talking about their window signs? No. Yeah, but they're like more. They're more. They take up the whole window. They do. Okay, so they're still not compliant. Right, okay. but if they had, um, I don't know, pastoral scene or something, you know, support scene. Yeah, could they cover the whole window? Well, so, so that's. Right, right, that's a different right. It would still be a it would still be a mural. I mean, it would still be a it would still be a window well, sign. Well, but so that's combining two yeah. areas of the bylaw, and that would be another thing where we would be like, how do we enforce this? Right. I think uh, I think it's easy to say whether something is more of a sign or than it isn't. Um, you know, the the sporting goods store on Main Street would put up uh, hockey pictures and stuff, hockey yeah. you know, screens. Um, that's kind of showing what they're selling inside, especially if it says, you know, power or if it has a manufacturer's logo on it. But if it had ice skating scenes of people at Sturgis Park skating in the winter, you know, would that be okay? What, so I guess, just educate, so I understand that you don't want people covering their entire window, right? I get those regulations to some degree you want people on the street to be able to view inside. But what's the big deal with a store putting up an, an image of something that they, like an original art display image of something that they sell or do inside that store? Because if it's really just, say, again, back to this hockey thing, right? Like a Bauer, a, a goalie decked out in Bauer equipment, and it says Bauer on it, <laughs> it's more of a sign than it is an artwork, so it's though, the so words maybe that are the issue. Yeah. Well, yeah. and so and so, like, right, move that forward. The brands and the words. So w the former Walgreens property, right? Mm -hmm. There are windows there, right? And whoever moves it, if the sports guy moves in there and puts up um, window artwork, right, like that, that's guys covered in Bauer, in in all of those windows. Right, and then has a sign on top of that, right? Then it's 
uh, just screaming hockey. Um, so the issue really that I'm is, hearing is the covering of the windows and like the branding or labeling or text. It's creating a, yet another... If they painted that same painting like on the brick face of the building and didn't cover the windows, would you have a problem with it? I wouldn't if it didn't have the branding on it. Yeah. Right. It's about recreate, um, creating a sign, yet another sign. Right. It's a, another right. way to get around the sign. So like the, the Walgreens is a good example, actually, because they have those pockets back there. So if they set up displays of the gear yep. that they were selling, I think that would be allowed, right? Because that's really, they're just showing what they're selling. Yeah, it's, it's, a it's not a sign, display. it's a window display. So I think we need to be more clear about like what it is we're trying to sort of prevent against. Can I jump in? Of course. Talk about some funny experience sale around signage and public art and murals and what this all kind of looked like for us. When Match Brewing Company came into Salem, we had a big discussion about signage and what they wanted to do was paint Notch, Notch Brewery on the side of their brick building with, an art, with a person who specialized in painting brick. We went back and forth, is this a sign, is this a mural, is this public art, is this not? And really our building inspector said the same thing. It was a sign because they were advertising their business with words. Fast forward to our experience with a marijuana place. There was already something on the facade of the building. It was a mural, and it didn't have any words or anything like that. But I think it's important for businesses to recognize that public art can be a helpful indicator for businesses. So that marijuana retail store as part of the Zoning Board of Appeals application and process and decision for that type of use also had a requirement to continue to have public art of any kind on their building um, consistently and that allowed for that mural to change over over time or if they want to do architectural lighting or, or something else. But from a business perspective, um, those business owners saw that mural or that public art display of some kind as beneficial in their marketing and branding of their company. And so by saying, hey, I'm in the building with feathers that are paint, you know, painted yeah, all yeah. over the facade. So there is, you know, from a business perspective, there's a benefit to having public art. Um, whether or not it's a sign, I lean towards saying like, a mural is not a mural or, or other types of public art are not signs unless the sign itself is specifically branding and the commercial component or whatever that component is of that store. So Bauer and Hockey. So a brewery then could have the Clydesdale horses yes. painted. Yes. But that is suggestive of a company <laughs> and yes. a product. And branding. And, so you and get into branding, copyright. but that's a toughie. You get into copyright issues yes. too, right? right? Into your public art displays. And I think that that's an important thing for artists who are across this yet my experience but um, that's not to say it doesn't exist artists really have to be aware of the types of um, icons and imagery that they're using to make sure that there is you know no copyright issues of that kind um, you know so public art is a benefit um, I don't think it necessarily belongs in signage um, but I do think that there are instances of you know painting signs that are specific to commercial types yeah, that's good. Yeah. Very. So original art displays, including murals, may not even belong in the site ordinance. So it's it it's in here, and then we say it's authorized. Okay. So that's yeah. well in some areas, in some places, uh, maybe, um, uh, including murals or other work or whatever. But maybe we need to look at this definition and be more clear about what it is. What it is. Um, rather than just like listing all the things that it isn't. Yeah. 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 Um, you start with that and then you figure out what you should, you can now. Right. The yoga studio, I remember, had that um, piece of art that's right. on the entrance to the parking lot. Yeah. And I think that the building inspector at the time deemed that to be a commercial message because it was a, a symbol that was known or related to or associated with yoga. Right. Is that really the one that yeah. alerted people that the business was out back? No, it's, no. Like it's, this, uh, it's on the side, yeah, and this 
mystical. Yeah, right. Like the Om sign or whatever, yeah. something like that. It yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. It, but it never said the name of the yoga studio yeah. or yeah. said yoga here. It's just like a lotus flower. flower. Mm -hmm. so I, like I think it's, there's a fine balance, right? So Dunkin' Donuts and Peabody has an art box or an electrical box that's painted with donuts on it. And that's one of the requirements that many cities and towns have is that art boxes need to like, kind of correspond with their current surroundings or like nearby surroundings and so they're you know I don't see that necessarily as a bad thing. No oh, that would be an interesting way to another interesting way to do that though is to have this art box that's associated with the business but doesn't scream with its branding. Right. That would be and okay. There's a serious benefit from a business perspective of having art that corresponds to space and, or place or experiences. Um, that isn't necessarily branded with Dunkin' Donuts on it or copyrighted material and imagery. And I, I think we there are many cities and towns that have lots of examples of trying to fine tune what that definition is, particularly through art, some language through art box programs that we could probably find to help define what it is or what it isn't that we want. So the exercise there is to just write out this is not allowed, this is allowed, this is not allowed. Just write a bunch of things out and then see what that means for a definition. So yeah. like in our box, we'd allow, or, but if it was branded, we wouldn't allow it. Right. Talk about what we would put right. in Right, right. Wasn't there a project in Boston years ago with heifer cows that they had artists come and paint? Mm -hmm. Or another one was, I don't know, dolphins was in another town. Mm -hmm. And they allowed them to be painted, but they weren't signs at all. They were art installations. But there was a completely, remember that, but there was a completely different governance of that fact. So, um, so I think, right, the issue there is that is the refining the, um, the definition. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then that will fall under, as it does right now, authorized signs. Yeah. Right. So, you know, that art box thing is really interesting because it'll give these businesses an opportunity to get that message out there without the branding piece, be a little more creative, and then it makes them feel like they're getting this additional sign mm -hmm. without putting up a blinking sign that says donuts. It's called place making. We call it place making, or, you know, it's really creating yeah. as a space. Yeah, identity for many places. Do you know how many art boxes are in? Like, I mean, how many uh, boxes? Uh, many. Public. Yeah, there's, a there's a lot. You can yeah. paint all the bollards too. You sure about that? <laughs> all right. Okay, and then well, the next. Going back to the boxes. Sure. Who owns them? Um. So that has yeah. to be a, that has to be distinguished. And RMLD probably owns. It's going to be a box. I mean, it could be the side of the wall. If a building has a, a blank masonry wall on the corner lot, you know, potentially you allow that. You allow them to do something there. Correct. That's all. The tin bucket has that little mural yeah. on the side. That's the mural we're talking that, about. Yeah, that's, that's the mural that, that started out as a yogi, yogi studio, uh, and that there was a there is a big issue about that, uh, and I think that was one of the areas. Uh, um, but I think I was, uh, I, I don't want to misspeak, so I'm not going to say. There might be some other details to that, but anyway. <coughs> yeah. Um, I don't think a mural needs variants. Or public permit. Or public display of any kind. When I was looking at, this is what I was going to say, was I was looking at the bylaw last year in relation to that and thinking that now it wouldn't require a variance. Yeah. Um, but I could be wrong about that. I so. think you're probably right. Probably um, at the time it did. Yeah. So we have modernized a little bit. Yes. <laughs> um, so on page nine, um, and maybe this is somewhere, but I noted like it's towards the bottom of the page that where we say, in addition to flags that are authorized under section 8.3.8.4, which um, is the you know federal the government, government flags, flags yeah. um, one flag shall be allowed as a temporary sign in all zoning districts um, on every privately owned property. So what I don't know is, did we ever clarify, like if a business were to put up a big pink sign that says open and take it in every night, 
is that is that okay? Um, I was. It's a temporary sign, so. Right. Um, we we couldn't regulate the content of that. Right. Gave it to That's them. right. Yeah, that could be okay. So here we say other flag, right. and we don't have a display period for other flag, and we don't even have a size. No, but the temporary sign stuff above it talks about um, no more than six its, square feet. Um, this is its so it's temporary. So sign. here we say each privately owned property in town shall be allowed at the top number one is that each privately owned property in town shall be allowed one temporary right. sign that is no more than six square feet. And then I see this as additional to that down here, number three, in addition to flags that are authorized. Temporary sign or that it could be in addition to the temporary sign and doesn't even matter. As I recall, the point was to be in addition to the temporary sign. Because that's how it reads. Like, right. that's how I read it. And, and that's how the table reads to me as well. That was basically um, so, say, a company called German Chocolatiers can have a German flag and an open flag. Right. Okay. All right. Good. So if you're all in agreement with that, that's actually helpful because I was wondering about that recently. Yep. Okay, so maybe it doesn't. Well, need if you to want to clarify. change the language so that it's more clear to somebody other than us, maybe. That's the intent. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right, great. Right. Uh -huh. So page 10. Um, under F. Yeah. Because I don't think it makes sense, and we came across it. What was the property that was asking? <laughs> Something that was using LED um, yeah. lighting yeah. as the, right. the, the backlighting, as the which light wasn't source. really the intent here. The intent right. was a uh, screen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, so that's just in line with how we're enforcing yes, it. Yeah. So LEDs, of course, are allowed as the light source. Yeah. Um, and then, so right now, Aaron, we're under the section where it's prohibited signs. Um, and I was trying to think of, um, page 10? yeah, mm -hmm. so page 10 under un F, um, we prohibit neon signs. Um, Banners as permanent signs. Um. I did want to just tell you that I drove in from North Reading today and there's a restaurant that has P I Z Z A neon flashing in the windows, and I was happy that we did not live in North Reading. <laughs> Those are just the cheap open ones that flash open. Flash. <laughs> just so, I mean, window. maybe like. Well, I, I don't know. I'm just trying to think, like, outside of the box a little bit. And, like, and maybe neon's not bad in every instance. I mean, just... I don't think anybody would make neon anymore. <laughs> I think they would make something that looked like neon using LEDs. But there would be somebody who would buy, like, a, a vintage neon sign. Right. Yeah. right. It up, but they'd probably put it inside because it's expensive. It's valuable. Okay. It's expensive to fix. You, you could get a public art thing, that vintage neons. There happened to be somebody who was movie sets and that was a big thing so they ended up putting neon signs outside um, all over downtown and it's like now this public thing public art walk that they have um, but no fl no flamingos no flamingos but laundromats and like ego mad and a big shoe and a couple of other fun things um, so it confuses people because yeah they think that it's a laundromat but it's yeah. not anymore but anyway, um, there might be a space for neon. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that we want to be flashing neon or right. Maybe we could those and it, we could really be specific to say vintage neon. I, I think if somebody came in with some sort of temporary art display that they were gonna, some installation they were going to do yeah. like up and down Main Street. Well, that wouldn't be considered a sign. I know, right? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> We could address that, yeah. I think. Yeah. I well, but, but to keep going, like, think of a place like um, Biltmore. You know, it's mm -hmm. it has a look and a feel that with a nice vintage neon sign would fit with that 
business in some ways. Right, and the problem, right, the problem is that perhaps they could do it, but then how do you zone out? Understood. They, they would do it nicely, right. but, you know, the, the nail salon would not. So, I mean, this next door. at least some uh, business be, you know, would come to you for a certificate of appropriateness. Uh, it's the other parts of town yeah. that would be less. I guess I'll say of all the things, I, I get it, of all the things we probably need to tackle on here, adding neon is, is not the biggest not priority. The biggest priority. <laughs> no, no, that's correct. And, and But but if we just blanket prohibit these things, we might be um, limiting creativity. Yeah. So that's. We're not, but oh, I'm sorry, we're just going to get, you're not going to get the businesses, so we're going to spend the money on a quality sign, and you're going to get crap, and it's going to. Yeah. I do think that there's Stuff other ways really they expensive. they can offer okay. creativity. It's not going to find the yeah, salon that's going to spend fifteen thousand dollars on the side. All right, so next. next. Move on. Yeah. Okay. Um. Banners can't be permanent signs. Again, cheap. They'll fly away. They'll they'll disconnect. They'll fade. I understand that on um, many levels. But I do think we might want to have a process in our bylaw that allows um, banners um, above the public sidewalk. Who's SB, um, by the way? Authorized by SB. Select board. board. Yeah, SB. Why is that? Because they oversee, you know, they're the road commissioners and they oversee other things that happen on the public sidewalk and in the right of way. It, um, and then it could be added to like something like the civic function permit or um, you know some of the other permits that they have. I'm sorry. Yeah, like what do you the, uh, what do you have? I'm not following what you what you have in your. Well, so right now, like the town can put up banners along certain because we're the town. But yep. if another entity like a nonprofit or the Rotary or the they who run the Fall Street Fair wanted to propose like some banners temporary for their for their event. Stretching the process. We basically say no because we don't have a good process for it. But that's not what this says. This says permanent signs. So I. Yep. This is about permanent signs. Right. I'm. I'm just highlighting the banners. So it's in the wrong place. Right. My comment about banners is in the wrong place. But that's. I yeah, think that's right. worth a discussion. Yeah. Right. Being a little more flexible for. Temporary signs. Um, right. Uh, we allow we allow banners in the public way, uh, like on telephone, but not telephone poles, but light poles. Right. We talked about this about having banners. They could potentially be marching up and down the street. I think it depends. Like, I don't think we have a good process for it. I can look into that for you. Um, so at the moment, the town or the Rotary Club, they. During the Christmas lighting, they couldn't put something across where everyone walks under a banner. Actually, could, banner? You, you, could I mean, you bang something across Main Street? It's not ours. Right? So it depends on which section of Main Street you're talking about. Because we do own from the railroad tracks of the fire station, technically. We just don't have a good process for allowing things like that in the public. We also way. Have, like, don't allow that height um, to be. If you're stringing across the street, it's going to be pretty high, which we don't allow. Yeah, it's going to be that height. Yeah. So we, so this is something we've come across a few times since I've worked here that we kind of just don't really have a process. So we say no, but maybe in some instances it would make sense. Yeah. And whether that's in zoning or with the select board, or I just figured sure. it would be yeah. something good to talk about during this conversation. Sure. But I apologize for the comment in the wrong place. Technically, that should be subcontracted out to the DPW. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want anybody else string anything across the, the street. But let, let's, we, we can yeah. note that as, a, as an item that we could take up. Um, and then off-premises signs, um, I added a little language to. So um, I was thinking specifically of two two locations, one of which is the um, the new dental place that went down in by the Shell Station and the Dunkin' Donuts on Walker's Book Drive. Mm -hmm. How she had an easement rights over her neighbor's property to put up a sign to help people get to her business on the back. Mm -hmm. So it's technically an off-premises sign. Um, 
I thought we had language for that, though. If we, we called it a weight finding sign. Um, no, something about if a business is set back X feet from the, you know, that was in the residential, I think we, right, we had something in the residential zone. We have setback requirements for businesses in residential zones. Or were you, are you talking about like yard sales? No, I thought there was some signage. Um, oh no, there was, there was. Yeah, so I think you're allowed a larger sign if you're set back yeah. further, not No, nope. it was an off-premises thing because there's a property that came up. flags and feather banners like we as a town say no to that what if there was a car dealership I mean do they get a variance for that they would have to get a variance it would have because to. we don't allow it right that's yeah. what I'm asking so right. like in other towns they may have the same thing but those businesses would ask for a variance but I'm guessing in towns with like an auto mile they probably don't probably have it yeah. right well, that's what I was thinking they would yeah. just have so everybody many variance putting applications up feather all the time, at the time. Dunkin Donuts every, yes. everybody yeah. else was putting up a feather banner yeah. they looked like yeah. crap they yeah. looked like cheap tacky crap and that's something that we enforce a lot but I'm not proposing that you change it I'm not just so I do think uh, I'll say to move things along I do think the off premises sign um, that there are issues with uh, there are certainly situations where that is needed mm -hmm. um, and I think coming up with whether it's in there already or, or not coming up with something that sort of facilitates those conditions where it, 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 it's rational to have an off-premises sign and we're not talking like billboard you know like just spread around but something you know, like more, more directional or where it may make more sense to have the sign in a location that doesn't happen to be on your property but on the adjacent property and it, right with the correct authorization yeah. yeah I do think there are instances in which it could be helpful yeah. um, really a question for you mm -hmm. on proper authorization do you know what authorization type or I think subjective. it could take different forms. Like if the owner of the off-premises site had a directory and had a space on it, or if they granted easement rights, like in the case of the um, dental place. Um, and then also it requires a certificate of appropriateness from the CPDC, so you guys would have to review it. Um, so you're asking for a letter from property owners? Um, so we, uh, that detail I haven't thought in great okay. um, length about. Um, okay. But we can talk about that. Um, well, it's all going to be different, so you're just going to need the documentation. Yeah. Whether it's an easement, a lease agreement, right. a rental agreement, just the words, yeah, they can do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, and that will help with, like, some of the buildings downtown that have um, businesses kind of in the back or that aren't necessarily easy to see or know how to get to. I was going to ask, like, so what, how, is there a solution for Cafe Nero? And the, the tree that obscures the sign. That's an off premises. I mean the trees. <laughs> um, the trees, it's gorgeous. I wouldn't ever have anyone move it. Only but. tree in town that will survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so actually I think is Anya's in that building? Yes. It's around the back. Yeah, so Anya's is an example where it's in the back and like um you know, her customers don't always know how to get there, and then like getting there driving is a challenge because of the one-way streets. Um, and so having like something kind of on the main street alerting people exactly. to go around the back would be helpful. Where yeah. the Pilates studio was able to put right. that sign up because it was actually on that same building, so it was the same property, it was on premises, right. but her sign wouldn't be on premises because it's not necessarily it the same be. building, it might um, not be. But it, I guess depending on like where she could work that yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. 
I think it's those situations. So yeah. Like so like, so that's an example. It might not be like a an exact example of when that, that would happen, but like something in the back like that. Um, I can't find the language in the current zoning code, but I swear I remember just I remember there being something in the code okay. about allowing a sign. It was set way back to have a sign, essentially off premises. Okay, so that'll be your homework to find that. Nineteen seventy. There is that. They had the, they added a definition for off premises sign in nineteen seventy eight. See that. Um, window signs. So here, now we're getting into one of the areas that um, we see a lot of non-compliance and it's hard to take uniform enforcement because there's just so many and such a proliferation and we always ask the question, like, why? Um, what's the harm in some of it? Language. Yeah. Uh, so I can tell you why part of it is here. Right, and some of it I understand. Um, no, you just get cheap letters stuck to the outside and then half mm -hmm. of them peel off and it looks like mm -hmm. crap again. So that was the idea about sort of in enforcing that it needed to be this um, quality material if it was going to go on the outside. Mm -hmm. But if you make them put it on the inside, then... Right, yeah, that part I don't have a problem with. Um, so sometimes things are cheaper to do one side than the other. We were allowing that flexibility, but right. and too cheap, and it looks like it looks bad. And the same with trying to come up with some order to everything that they're going to want to put in their window, because they just businesses just think that more signs means more business, and it's just not true. I've said it before. It's the right signs, having the right, yeah, signs, the right signs and the right marketing, and the, the many pronged strategy. They want to advertise every little thing they're selling. Mm -hmm. The whole thing has to be covered. That just looks well, especially for business B, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make it walkable and friendly, mm -hmm. and blocking up an entire window doesn't do that. Yeah. But now if you get to, say, Gold's Gym in the industrial area where nobody's walking by, that might as well just be a blank wall, in effect. It's not really having pedestrian traffic. so. Is there some case here where you're concerned about the windows, opening up the windows that people walk by versus the ones that may be in a back alley somewhere? Well, and to Tony's point, should we look at this differently depending on whether it's in business B right. or in industrial zoning? Right now it's lumped under signs in business and industrial zoning districts. So we are enforcing the same rules at Gold's Gym that we would be at PBA Dental downtown for. Best example, but yeah. Okay, that's not the best example. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. You can't right. see in there. I think anyways. these were pretty generic, that's right. though, right? Yeah. yeah. Just popped into my head. And the first four. Uh, D is where we start talking about things applied to the window. It's actually just D. Um. Just D five one D, and then there's one through five, and then the eight through. So. It's all about window signs. So provisions E through K actually need to be bumped out. They're, they were subordinated incorrectly. Um, so e, those should be six. Those should actually be six no, through. No, they're E under the le, the D. Under the letter D here. On page ten. It's D one through five, and then. Unfortunately, <coughs> five has um, five times four subcategories. So, Oh, oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. It just, yeah. Happened, to show it just happened to be right in the right. Yeah. 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 In the past, we probably would have had I, 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 I. Oh, Instead yeah, yeah. Letters. Right? Yes. Yeah. <coughs> well, the one through five need to be bumped in because they're under D. Think. Yeah. 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 All right. No, no. It's, uh, it's it is correct. bumped in a little bit. No, it bit. is bumped okay. in. Yeah. It's just the... E, e, e needs to, to go be further back out. than the right. one to five. Oh. Yeah. Yep. So, um, yeah. but I was wondering, like, do we, what's the issue with the letters larger than eight inches in height, for example? Eight inch letter. Like, 
so I'm trying to think if the uh, if 38 or whatever is well in pot to pull in pot place or to put I just or whatever it is. If they wanted to run a banner about that about that high across you know the band of that glass, which is really not often much bigger than that board there. Okay, I guess I'll start with a different question. Are there any provisions here that you don't really care about? That you think maybe we can... I need pictures. Like, honestly, I just have a really hard time picturing all of these different... Well, I think that's part of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Places that have some signage up. It's a good point, Rachel. I just everything, you know. Yeah. I, I would prefer to have like yes, no. <laughs> like, I know. I just I they, cannot. They I can't give you like feedback because I can't picture sure what's what's good and not good. Right. Okay. I think I think right the the thing that's to me whether that letters could be larger than eight inches or not. I think um, I. I I think that's actually covered elsewhere because that if you have a if you have a sign that can't exceed six square feet and it's mm -hmm. only thirty percent of the um, glass sheet or sash, there's only so much that you can do anyways. Yeah. Um, you know, and if their sign is three letters and it, those letters are fifteen feet high. I mean, 15 inches high. Do I? I don't care if, as long as they're still not taking up the whole window. Totally agree. Right. I can care less how big those letters are. Yeah. It's to me. It's the are they covering up the whole window? Right. With a sign. Right. Well, because even if you might have a 15 inch letter Z, right, and right. you can still see in, like both. You know I what I mean? Care. Like you can. Yeah. Like, it's really I'm, not. Yes. And it provides for. Places that are bigger, bigger window, thirty percent may yeah. end up being bigger than eight right. inches. Right, and eight, yeah, eight inches might not scale well to the building. Like, right. Um, so, okay. but I guess that really, I think that even before all of this, right before this version of the sign bylaw. Um, weren't you having a hard time enforcing, and it may not have been you, um, but you could you could ask Jesse probably, um, uh, uh, enforcing the thirty percent of a glass sheet or sash. Yeah, the window signs are just um, just tricky in general. The window signage, it, but it, I, don't, I don't know about specific enforcement. No, but so and so, you know, thinking about thinking about that, um, it, I, I would imagine that's you know, in, um, that's where you get in, where it's problematic trying to enforce. But that is a, yeah one of the air ways in which this is problematic. Like, to y like you yeah. look there, like mm -hmm. oh, what's thirty percent? Of that window, <laughs> oh, I need to go and measure this whole window. You know, like no, oh, there's the applicant is supposed to do that. But they don't always they, have to apply, or they don't. They don't, they don't always apply. Right, because window signs don't. Window do this signs don't have applications. So just right. do it. But we can't zone. We can't write zoning based on the fact that somebody might ignore it. No, I but, know, but no, it but you can write things that are that um, are you you're capable of enforcing. Right. You can enforce all of this. You get rid of the eight inches if you want. It's 30 thirty percent of that window. It's enforceable. Why do you have and to have a six a, square foot? It's not minutes. subjective at all. No, it's not subjective. We're not talking about it's subjective. It's not subjective. But does but, but is, does town staff have that sort of time to go out and measure <laughs> that but window and do all that? I mean, so it's so so, so the reality is anything. it's not getting done, right? And so I. Okay, so let's say 100% of the window. It's easy to see if it's 100%, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then we don't Fill need a regulation up. at all. Right, no permits. I mean, we don't have a permit requirement for window signage, so... Just have a certificate of appropriateness for every sign. 
<laughs> I guess I guess it does come down to like what's your philosophy? Like, my philosophy. Where's my philosophy? job? Just got a lot harder. Not my job. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my philosophy on architecture, right? <laughs> architecture, 90% of architecture is not architecture, it's building. It's true. Somebody's yeah. building crap. Yeah. And then there's, you, you get lucky sometimes that there's something good, right? Signage is the same way. Everybody thinks they know better, and then you just put up crap, and it looks horrible, okay? God forbid they have to come to you and hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you bring them to me, they won't put their signs up. <laughs> I, understand, I understand the enforcement issue. But that doesn't mean we should write zoning so that we don't have to worry about it. I'm not it. suggesting that. I'm trying to say let's write zoning that incentivizes what you want. Scroll back to the corner Rather of Rather than Bank. just kind of they disincentivizes sign, has and has so many rules that no one can make heads or tails of it. Um, like what is it that you're trying to zone Move against? Forward. They're right there. It says bank. Bank that's eight inches high. Third window in, right? Third, third bay in. Green sign. Between the two cars. Right there where, yeah. Just right. left of your curve. Just left of and you want me to Nope. Oh. Yeah, right there. Yeah. See right there where it says bank on the window. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's more than eight. Yeah, that's more than 30%. That's actually, more than 30%. But. It's probably pretty close, though. You don't count close. the sides. I mean. It's a pane of glass. You can see that it's, it's more than. It's close to it, but. It's, uh, it's probably pretty close. But it's transparent for the most part. Right. That large lettering is probably eight inches. To your point, if that were a Z, and it almost looks like a Z if you look at the top horizontal, mm -hmm. the bottom, yep. the top. I'm okay with what you were saying about getting rid of the age requirement. The 30% seems to make sense. Or you could say that it has to be mostly transparent somehow. If you remember, um, Professor's Market wanted to put a whole bunch of words on their door, but they were filling up the entire door. Mm -hmm. It was more than 30%. They, they couldn't get over that fact for some reason. Mm -hmm. So there, that that's something that almost complies, probably does, with this language. Is that a bad sign? No, and I'm not saying that there's not a rhyme or reason to these regulations. I'm just saying let's maybe reduce them to the few things that really matter to you and, and, and okay. have our sign by law reflect what it is that you care to regulate in reality. I think if you limit it down to the 30% that covers most conditions and that makes sure that you can still see through the windows and I, I agree that letters can be big but in theory they could put B-A-N-K in those four windows at mm -hmm. 30% and the letters would be bigger. Right. I don't think it would be that bad of a sign depending upon how they did it, what font they use and the coloring and so forth. Or it could look hideous. Or it could look hideous. <laughs> you can do you can do hideous on purpose too. Yeah. But but so we have this odd statement here: be neat and professional in appearance and be maintained right. at all times. And that, that means they can't go to the, the dollar store and buy the adhesive letters and put them. But I'm not professional. I'm not walking with them to the store where they're buying their signage and making yeah. sure that they're getting it. I'm, I mean that. Yeah. I just I don't know how you legislate. The wrong word. They go to a sign maker for the most part. So then say that. Professionally. Like, yeah. I think that's maybe getting at like if it's getting one. There's no appearance. Like, what if we just say be maintained at all yeah. times? I like, think that's all we get rid of the neat and professional in appearance. Um, because that's a little subjective. They're applied. You don't maintain them when they're applied. Well, when, they're, when they start to peel off or get. When I take a shoe polish and go 30% off. But so, I mean, I guess I'm also curious about the enforcement mechanism. And I know I'm like the queen of examples here, but I live around the corner from Dynamic. And like, that's not the most professionally done signage in the in general. Like, is, is that non-compliant? I have to look. Originally, theirs was non-compliant because Probably. they had the goalie in the window, yeah. which was something. But, even, but what about the... the you know, condemn, not condemn building next door. It had no. even is it soft letters, letters. Yeah. dynamic on it. Down street and see a picture of a goalie in a window. Is that no, such I, a I big no deal? No problem with it, except that was the rule that was in place. Right, so let's put the rules in place that we want. If yeah, you don't but, have right, and so the, that's the big thing is dynamic may do it okay. Yeah. We can guarantee you that 
the, the, the next business down. I don't know who that is, but they're not. They're not going to do it, right? If, 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 if Gold's Gym were on Main Street and you had pictures of scantily clad women lift, um, uh, lifting weights, you know, like, I don't know. You can't re regulate for right? content. You can't regulate for content, and that's probably not okay. I mean, that's probably, you'd have a different perspective on that, right? Right. I think a lot of people in town probably would. So is I, the issue maybe that you need, and maybe I'll get laughed out of town for saying this, but that you you need, you want to review signs in other areas, not just business B? Like, should we have a process? Like allow a little bit more flexibility, but oh, have a process. Oh, you mean that right there? No. <laughs> um, these are yeah, these yeah. are like yes. stick-on ones. Yeah. 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 That's what I'm saying. Like those are stick-on. Like if you're talking you're about one business might do it right, and another yeah. business might not. Like you know. That's why what I was getting that. at was that if you it's allow. Cool. A, B, and C. You better this respect D, E, F, and G, right? Mm -hmm. So if we set the limit at 30%. You're lucky if you get them down to 50%. Remember what CVS did down the street here on that. They're like Even those, like, when it was CVS you know, or whatever. Put them in a car sale. Right at all time? Osco. Oh, Osco. something before that. Oh, the Osco. Yeah. The drugstore Osco. Yeah. Brooks. Was it Brooks? Yeah. Right. Brooks to Osco. Right. So they, yeah. they covered more than 50% of their window with a blue film. You know, all of them. Right, but I mean, I guess from a staff standpoint, like I would rather help people through a nice process with you guys than and and have it be a friendly mm -hmm. encounter and like yeah. and a conversation with you and a certificate of appropriateness than like do enforcement and have yes. to explain yeah. these these things that are like um, seem a little nitpicky to explain. Then it might be helpful to have more examples so that they have some ground rules that they can visualize because some of the things that we've seen come up. Not acceptable. And going back to Tony's point, though, if they put B A N K in four panels there, thirty percent high, right? Mm -hmm. That's probably not going to look good. So they no, hope, hopefully that's where the eight they inches. Will, so maybe we'll eight self inches correct and not do that. Maybe there's a limit on. You could do some sort of percentage in relation to the scale of the of the square footage of the facade, so you get something that's almost uh, not necessarily. That's, that's what their main sign is based on, right? Right. Oh my. Right. men, they're all women. Have you guys driven through a town recently where you're like, yes. this is the look that I want? No. The opposite. Sunday, I was on Route One. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm pretty sure no, but, that that's been like that for. That's an right. example, but I needed to make a right turn into one of the lots, and there were so many signs mm -hmm. that it's hard to discern, yes. you know, at 100 feet mm -hmm. where that turn yeah. is, yeah. where my sign right, is. Right. And right. That's what we're trying to avoid on right. Main Street. I get that. Wilmington is the same way, right? 35 or 38, it's over 38. Mm -hmm. It's just. So much so, oh, yeah. 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 I would suggest a process. I think that would be really helpful for staff from an enforcement side and then also from a public side. And and then really think hard about what matters to you and from like a public perspective, we've been talking a lot about having our windows on Main Street not be fully covered, right? That's the intent of our signage limits, but we also talked about things like aesthetics, which can be subjective. And so I think that's a really hard balance in signage, right? And um, the aesthetic part is something that I know that I've grappled with for a long time, and we all do. Um, and we need to make sure that we're allowing, and I think a public process will help with that element, yeah, for I there to be a process and a conversation. a public process that allowed you to waive anything, provided it was a good design, like we do with some of the other things that we don't want to try and figure out because we can't figure out all the parameters of it. Some creative person can come in and find a way to make the B A N K. <laughs> so, um, are we talking about a process that also includes for window signage, which currently, right now, like I was. I was thinking about 
a process similar to like what we do in business B for other zones and currently like window signage isn't wrapped into that but what should it be you can do the, you could do the process for the other zones mm -hmm. right which matches whatever we're doing in business B the process mm -hmm. you could have another process for window signs mm -hmm. that allows you to waive any of the requirements if they come up with something creative that gives you the most flexibility you could have somebody could potentially cover up the entire pane of glass with elements but still has some sort of transparency to it, has some order to it. Aesthetics is hard to dictate or everyone to agree on, but order is a little different. Order is a little more obvious to people when you show it to them. Still hard, still hard, right? Yeah. You might have competition of designers. You don't always see it, but then when someone yes. points it out, you can start to see the, the ordering factors. And the window panes are the biggest ordering factors mm -hmm. that we have, right? So what you're saying, well, other than the a certificate of appropriateness for the other zones, which mm -hmm. I I can't believe I'm the one saying it. I don't <laughs> think they should be that should be necessary. Well, maybe that can be a staff thing. They don't have to come yeah. here for that. Then at least you get eyes on it. And I'm for assuming the, that for windows or for no for signs. Just for signs. See what for signs. Right now, it is a staff thing. Right now, I think maybe it needs to be a board thing. It's fine with me. I thought we were trying to get things into the daytime. Well, the problem is... I mean, i just rather spend my daytime hours um, helping people, you know, meet what it is that you want here in preparation to come to see you than, you know, looking over a list of businesses I need to contact because they're not conforming. Your signs are not conforming. We're not talking about an enforcement process. We're talking about... No, I know. I'm talking about process. having looping other zoning yeah. districts into yeah. our process so that they can just come to you and have an approval and put something up that, that meets our zoning bylaw um, that you like. So allow more flexibility in what you allow and then let them, because when you allow flexibility, you, you end up with some good and some bad, but you get to review them all. I don't know if that's the right solution. It's just an idea. Like be burdensome for businesses to have to come before the board. It might be what burdensome for right. businesses to have to come before the board versus staff having very clear criteria right. to make a decision. And you know, I lean toward having this board set very specific criteria with multiple examples. So when we're talking to businesses, that's gonna be hard. it might be helpful. Would you be able to have flexibility in the process where you yeah. could review it as staff, but if you felt it was too too large or too complex that it would come to the board? Or is that too subjective? Over a certain size. Well, I mean, I guess. What are your thoughts? Those, those are my thoughts. I would, I'd be okay with having the two processes. One for window signs that allows a lot of I, I, I guess I'm trying to, so one of the other pieces is that it's, it's, it's onerous for businesses right now, right? So they don't know what to do. The bylaws onerous. Yes. Right. So. You know, I, I think thinking about what we're being clear, being flexible, but not adding stacks of process. Yeah. As both to obtain our objectives, but also to not make people go through the gambit to get there. And I don't. The burden's only there if you want to diverge from the bylaw. The bylaw has this criteria in it. If you think it's vague, we can clear it up if you want to get rid of the eight inch mm -hmm. thing, for example, there. If I mean, I think it's, it's, it's this, also, you know. Prescriptive, or you come in with some performance based. Mm -hmm. So we started this yeah. conversation oh, yeah, because I we were talking yeah, about yeah. window yeah. signs, yeah. and window signs currently don't have a process at all. So, like, other types of signs do, and it's not that difficult for staff to look at a sign on bus in business A and decide whether it meets the criteria and issue a permit. Um, it's the it's the ones that currently like fall through the cracks because there is no process for them. Didn't we review um, a, a window sign recently for the pizza place? The pizza place. I no, that, that was window their, sign. Or they had window signs that weren't compliant, and I think they were told to remove. That them. was Remax. That was Remax. Remax. So the pizza place came in. That was an awning. The criteria. That was an awning. Allowed anyways. 
comment, yeah. but there was a I, I like that. I Going Big back to changes. just focusing on window signs, right. the yeah. idea that, you know, maybe hone these down a little bit mm -hmm. in the one, in you know, in the signs that we would, um, that you can just go and do, right? Um, but if you want to do something different that diverges from that, that has a little bit more flexibility than to than to come for a certificate of appropriateness and go through the process that we could then look at something um, that diverges from this. Related to window signage. Related to window signs. But so to go back to my nemesis, like what is the teeth in this? If someone is non-conforming with a window sign so that it's not being professionally maintained and it's peeling off, you have a mechanism to say this is not conforming you must come back to us or it doesn't matter like so i guess that's my point of like are we right. writing these rules to something that is just writing them and they just exist i think the challenge is that many businesses don't realize the window sign regulations even, exist yeah. and so when we find out about non-compliant signs they're already up they businesses have already spent a lot of money on them um we're just in a tricky spot so maybe at least in business B we can loop this into the certificate of appro appropriateness process so if they are wanting to do window signage they can add that into their application that would be one way to make them aware yeah. of it up front and they can come, they come to you anyway so it would just be part of the application um, and the other districts but then it's still like so then language in here that basically ding something ding someone for something down the road, not at that certificate of appropriateness point, it's extraneous. You know, it should be, you, you need to write it as if, you know, it, the, the sign has to be set up so that it can be maintained or that it, you know, won't peel. But if, unless you're going to go back and be like, here's the bylaw, you, you are non-conforming, there's no reason to write it in right. like the future tense. We could just take this out of the authorized signs or the what section is it under? Um, in the table, we say that there's no permit required for window signs, and we could just put it on the every applicant for any sign in town, except for temporary signs and window signs, has to fill out a sign permit application. So we could just add window signs to that, so they fill an application for it, and then we can review it in advance. Um, and what happens to an applicant who's, say, changing his sale every week? Same window sign, basically, just for placing the text on on the one he hangs in the window. Does he need an application every week? Do you get one application that says, we don't really care so long as it fits in this size? You can't regulate the content. Yeah, and like if it's one hanging thing or whatever, it'd be one hanging thing. Right, okay. Um, I don't know if that's the right, I'm just trying to yeah. talk this through a little bit. I don't know if any of these suggestions are the right way forward. From a business perspective, I think it makes sense to be standard. So all signs, if there's a permit for signage, have it be, or all of it, have it be blanketed there. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's really confusing to a business who would want to see something that's wall mounted plus, and they need a permit for that, but they don't need a permit for their whatever temporary sign and they don't need a thing for their window sign like streamline the process so it's really easy to get the word out and have businesses understand how to mm -hmm. when they apply for the building sign are they also given a list of the bylaw or a note that says by the way uh, while you're applying for the outside sign here's the rules for windows and and temporary signs and so forth no, but they could be. I mean, right now the sign bylaw is, is, well, it's always been pretty cumbersome. It's actually a little better than it was, I think, a few years ago. There's um, a like sign that complies. Looks pretty good. It's actually a couple. <laughs> that doesn't comply. Yeah. <laughs> Not that one, but the other one next to it. Yeah. <laughs> and does that one have a, a brand on it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it obviously yeah. belongs to them. Yeah. Yeah. But if the branding wasn't there, would you care if they had artwork in the windows that did that? Yes. In that particular instance, 
what you're looking for in a streetscape is that you can see through the window. That's a weird splice, right? That's just, that's not the way the street really works. Yeah. Well, but I guess, really, I think the point, is, the, the problem here is that, so let's take, let's take this business as example. Um, there's, the, to, 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 to your point, is that, okay, I, you know, I set up the business, I remember when, when I set up the business, you know, 10 years ago that I had to get a permit to do, you know, to do all sorts of things, build out this, build out that, and I put my sign up, that's good, you know, if I'm going to go get a new sign, I'm probably going to go get a sign maker and they're going to know that I need a permit anyways. Once I'm done with that and I put, you know, I spent, you know, a couple hundred bucks or a thousand bucks or whatever it is to get all those, you know, to put the, the sign in the window and put that all on and it's getting, it's getting ratty and I want to change it out or whatever and I am, there is, I am never going to remember or even think that I need to come to town hall to change that little sign that looks like an eye in my window um, to something different. And you know what? This time I decide, like, I want to make it this and this and bigger. And I'm not going to think that I need to come to town hall. There's Where no way that I would sign? think of that. Where are you getting the sign? I'm ordering it online, it's some um, some some sign application thing, right? And where I design it all online, and they ship it to me over Amazon, and you know, like I go and put it up, right? I mean, I, is, it, am I, is that far fetched? No, no. Spelled. What? It will. It probably would be misspelled. And, and if I can spell, then I'll ship it back. If not, I mean, you all put up a misspelled sign. It happens all the time, right? And they'll just be cutting the letters. But from I that. think <laughs> that's right. I mean, that's it, right. That's obviously that's the problem. That's the problem with window signs. Is there? It's not obvious that it's something that should be regulated. I and I, I even. It's true. I, I'm even, I, I would even go, I, I'd go even further back maybe, or at least think about going further back, that, um, that maybe you, you really just cut it down to the, you're not allowed to cover up more than 30% of the window, um, and have some guidelines of what, what we would want as a business community, um, but just yeah. because I, yeah. it's going to continue to, to be an, an issue. You're right. But, uh, so uh, this is a good example, though. So, like, you see this right now. It's like someone going to go walk down there and say, take your posters down? Okay. Yes? Sometimes. It's been done. It's been done. It's not the night. It's, it's not great. I know. So not, that's my. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. We're trying to be more business friendly, and we're trying to, you know, establish a district management organization, and we're trying to have positive well, interactions with business be owners, friendly. and <laughs> and uh, and then we're stuck with like, these crazy regulations. So let's let's we. we we spent a lot of time on this, so there's a bunch of yeah. You can't tell from that clock. We spent uh, <laughs> two seconds on it. Um, 908. 908. So so let's. This is definitely right. There's more time. You've heard yeah. some yeah. feedback, some thoughts, um, right? A lot of stuff thrown out there. Um, but this is good. We can like really think about yeah. it Maybe and then try to propose yeah. some yeah. stuff. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, Do we want to keep talking about signs? There's a few other things in here. Um, well, let's, um, without getting into the detail, the, I guess the other one that you probably need some feedback in on that I write, it's in here a lot, is the, um, the A-frame signs. Yeah, that one and um, like what to do with multi-tenant buildings that have more than like two stories. Yeah. That's like another one that comes up. Um, so we don't have a good, good way of handling that. Um. Well, my input on the A-frame signs is that they're designed more for slow moving traffic pedestrians. Mm -hmm. So it makes no sense for a large shopping center to have A-frame signs out there. It would be done by the individual tenants, but the whole point of you being in the large shopping center is that you get the traffic based from the shopping center. 
Just my two point. Where, where are we seeing them in large places? Because I'm with you. I don't imagine they're anywhere other than for real estate open houses or on pedestrian streets. So a number of businesses put them up along South Main Street, actually. Where? South Main? Yep. Um, I think from Calarusa's down to Burger King. I don't know who does it, but that's okay. South Main Street. In the public right away or? Uh, no, not, no on, the on the wrong property. So this is the thing I was talking about before. Um, in one area of the bylaw it could be construed that we allow it, in another it's clear that we don't. So, um, you know, we have a process to the select board for business B. You know, people get a license to put on the public sidewalk. I think that makes sense. Um, and then we currently, we say, like, we just don't allow it anywhere else. A-frames are not allowed anywhere else in town. Um, but I think on private property, in certain instances, it should be fine. A-frames just aren't the most offensive signs out there, really. Okay. So as long as right. they are not the most offensive signs out there. And so as long as they're not mm -hmm. in the public way, right. and they come towards one of your temporary signs, that's OK. And they're not 12 feet tall. Right. We have a, a six-square-foot limit or something. Temporary sign. Yeah. So I think we just need to clarify yes. that the A-frame can count towards the temporary and sign. I think that's probably uh, universally agreed yeah. um, okay. here on the board that, that that's fine. So if it counts as their temporary, I, but... That's how I like to but, interpret this. Yeah, so yeah. if we need to make some changes to here to make that more... So it can count towards the temporary sign as long as it's on private property. property. Yeah. Right, so not on the sidewalk. Right. Um, Can it be on the sidewalk, like there, where there's no where to put it? Uh, this that is goes the business through a process. Page. So yeah, so that they would go through the licensing process here, and we would work with them to figure out a place to put it where it doesn't block the sidewalk. Um. It's a really current picture, isn't it? Because the building's already blue behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the the side writing on the wall sign. Hey. November 2018. Yeah. Where do you see that? Yeah. Well, right hand corner. And you know, okay. copyright. You know what's amazing? It probably doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what? <laughs> yeah, I know what it is. That they don't have a. Uh, the the wall eye doesn't. doesn't. Just like walk in. I mean, it's weird that there's no awnings. <laughs> They're supposed to have awnings? They don't have enough signs. It's weird. <laughs> I don't it. like it. I don't we like looking at this. <laughs> fix it. Mandatory. Well, it actually, we could get this. This um, is a nice segue to we add the thing in here about defund. Yeah. So on page 16, we were thinking that we might want to add something in here that ties the removal of a defunct sign from a business that's no longer to the installation of a new sign, so that we don't just have a big gaping hole in the wall with the masonry exposed and there are some examples in downtown right now where that's the case and it would be better almost if they just left the sign that was beautiful up there even though it's the business is gone because it's, it's more of an eyesore now than it was before um, so maybe there's like a 30-day window between removing a defunct sign and putting up a new one or something like that yeah, or like I, I don't know how yeah. I haven't really given this a lot of thought. Um. The only problem is non-conforming signs. Well, right. this says it conforms. If the sign conforms to provisions of the section. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but on the non-conforming thing, I think that's a really interesting point, that if you take a non-conforming sign down, then you don't have that non-conformity or grandfathered in anymore, and, you know, that could be really problematic for uh, forcing removal of defunct signs, and, you know, from a static perspective, like, forcing on that particular building to maybe we want to allow for that sign to be there. Oh, I'm looking at the exact opposite. The exact opposite, because oh. there's a lot of signs that are using grandfathering that we that we would. You don't want. Yeah. So yeah. I would say here that this is where Maybe you have some, some flexibility. Maybe yeah. you could say, go ahead. Um, Name some. Yeah. Can you give me some examples of that? Yeah. There's one that if we try, if we open these blinds, you could see. Is that here, right? 
yep. on highway signs a lot that are really tall or... Are you um, talking about in the business B? There are signs that are... We can talk offline. I don't yeah. know what it yeah. is you're talking about. What if you just added some flexibility in here that, um, that allows you to approve a defunct sign to remain in place until a new one is put in? So, for example, if um, I mean, Ben Cook's Spice's sign is not horrible, right? Mm -hmm. No, but it's probably not painted behind it. So if it were removed... Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's better. Right, exactly. yeah. but if That's it what was an at. old, non-conforming, backlit, you know, horrible panel where they're just going to flip the panel around sometimes. You right. Know, when they, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you could potentially say, no, leave that in place until the next business comes in and we'll deal with it then. I would just add yeah. some language and be able to allow that. All right, we can work on that. Yeah. With the yeah. approval of whoever it is going to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's removal of, of the of a existing sign makes uh, the location unsightly. It should remain in place until it, it can be. I mean, sometimes we should not know until you take it off, but yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, but that is what I'm look, trying yeah, to do. Yeah, you probably have a good guess. <laughs> you can yes. probably have a good guess, yes. yeah. There's four yeah. panels that just keep getting applied to it. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> we should all go into the signs. All right, so. By the way, what I was getting at when I asked John where they were going to buy their sign was that most of the sign makers know that there are sign regulars. Yes. They do. No? Yeah, but by the same token, how many sign makers Unless have come here going and, to Amazon they know that and know that, that they're not supposed to have a translucent background and still propose it? <laughs> Whenever Anne the Chico comes in, everything's really Yeah, but that's not the Chico. So she should be the only one allowed to <laughs> contract sign. I'm not sure we can work that into this. <laughs> I'm writing it in now. Um, no, there have been several sign makers that have come in that have done good jobs. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah. there are. Yeah. There are stuff, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. You just have to do it once in a town to know the town has regulations. So. Um, and for two-story structures, that's going to be a long discussion. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I think that we... Okay, that's an important one, I think, especially as we consider redevelopment um, taller buildings. My problem is that taller the sign, the more visibility it gets, and which is great for businesses, but not so great for, say, residents who have it shining in their bedrooms at 11 o'clock at night. Yeah. Right. Hmm. Okay. We will, uh, and, and I guess it, down the street a little bit, you'll see a horrible example of what would have been put on the upper level. That would be running co-op bank. Yeah. Those realtor signs are horrible. It is. And they wanted to put that one above. Yeah, they did. On the second yeah. level. And it would have dominated that whole section of the street. Mm. It still does, and it's yeah. I'll come back for that discussion. Yes, yeah. we'll come up with some ideas maybe for. Well, I, I kind of had some in here already, but my biggest issue with it is that what they tend to do is they tend to say, "Okay, well, I'm given two square feet per linear foot, and so if I put it up here, it's." that bit much bigger. It's like, well, if we're going to allow you to put it higher, I want a smaller sign. Okay. So that there's some sort of trade-off. Mm -hmm. um, a la the uh, Lincoln Street development where they said, well, we're allowed X amount of feet, but we can't put it on the, across, so we're going to go up. <laughs> right. It, it, and, it, it, I guess, and then the, the, other, the other thing on that is, who are they really trying to, what's the view that they're trying to capture mm -hmm. with that sign, mm -hmm. right? Are they trying to get the, if it's two stories up, they're trying to get the uh, person driving it's, you know, 40 miles an hour down Main Street, or are they trying to get the person driving it 25 miles an hour down Haven Street, you know, that is not looking up. So all that sign is doing is not advertising how to get to your spot it's like right. people whizzing by so and that's you know and so we want to think about, about like that the industrial yeah. area where yeah. there's some high visibility and yep. you know differently than we think yes. about Main yep. Street yep. Um, downtown or down. second floor of the MF Charles and building even downtown you know yeah. Yeah. Those, in the old days those windows probably would have had lettering on them mm -hmm. for yeah. the business that was associated with them yeah, yeah so maybe yeah. we like right now we don't really allow anything um, 
right. Maybe because we're protecting. We, it I guess from they, they could do windows. The worst case. Right. I guess they could do window signage on the upper floors. I don't think so. I don't think any signage is allowed. All right, I have to so. look. But, but yeah, just allowing for some more alternatives, I think, would be good. Great. Should we talk about uses? Yep. Great. So, maybe you guys the definitions section, which I didn't make any changes to, even though it says track change dispersion on it. Um, because I was thinking I might, and then I didn't. Um, and also section five, the use regulations. And on that section, um, Andrew and I went through and we highlighted in blue um, uses that currently don't have a definition. And in some cases, I think that's fine. In other cases, I think it's not. Um, and that's because the code says or is interpreted as meaning that if it's not in here, it's not allowed, right? I'm talking about uses that are listed in the table that don't have a definition in section two. No, do not have yeah. that. Like what's a, what's a tourist or trailer company? And I do not believe that our zoning bylaw has that clause that says if it's not expressly permitted, it's prohibited. I have never come across that. I thought that's how we've always interpreted it. It doesn't say that in our bylaw. I thought that's how uh, the state interpreted it, though. I'm pretty sure that that's that. what our attorney told us. Which one? <laughs> the new ones or the old ones? Oh, what do we have? The ones you one? got bad advice from or the, the new ones? All attorneys give bad advice. We got new attorneys. New attorneys. <laughs> I mean, not new. No, Mariah. Mariah's married. That's our guy. Yeah. Still? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll check into it. Julie, did you? Some of us been through like multiple, multiple town, town councils. Did you yeah. include laundromat? I didn't, but we can if you. Probably should be added. I was surprised um, by some of these that aren't included. We want to add definitions first, right? Uh, let me just write this question down. Well, so, um, so I'll say that I think um, really the I'm going to say the most pressing thing in here because I think it impacts um, it impacts mm -hmm. uh, uh, pretty much any business that may be changing um, is. Uh, something that we changed recently that I'm not sure we really th thought through the ramifications mm -hmm. um, and this is that um, under her under the the, the food for thought document um, 4.6.2.2 where she's you know we say a change from of use from one use category to another um, uh, within an existing uh, structure um, is a trigger for review. So, um, so that phrase from one use category to another was something that was um, included in that section only last year. A couple of years ago, but same difference. Okay. Um, so, um, before that, it was any change of use, period. So, um, uh, so that. Did you end up reviewing, like, a lot of things that you felt, like, if it was any change of use, would it come to you, or was it done administratively? Well, most, uh, right, uh, well, a lot of time, more often than not, right, what would come to this board yeah. is, uh, no, what would, what would hap what happens in town is a change of one retail use to another. And it that does not come to us, right? Because it's still a retail use, right? That's what all, most of the uses are, right? right? Um, but the ones that would come is a, a, a bank to a retail use. So you had those coming to And we had those coming and to us. And you talk to them about parking and hours yeah. of operation yes. and yeah. externalities to a That might be, and yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, I'm going to say, Nick, um, there are probably a few that we said, eh, you know, oh, yeah, that's good, <laughs> move along. Um, but probably, uh, I'm going to say more that warranted 
discussion on those externalities than, than didn't. Um, so, so what's happening, I mean, what occurs now is if you look at how these use categories are, especially this business and service use category, um, that's, that, that's, a, that's a lot of different uses um, that don't necessarily need to come back to us for site plan review if they're not doing anything else, but could have some significant impacts on, on externalities, on parking, right. on traffic, on parking, um, <laughs> parking. Uh, um, vibrations from but, treadmills. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah um, all sorts of stuff. So, I might, um, oh, so we did that, we made that, that change at that time, right, to like Allow for smoothness. Yes, yeah, it's, but I'm it has not a chilling effect on people who want to locate businesses who want to locate in town, like having to go through a whole board process. Right, right, right. Um, but but uh, you know, if you look through here, what could happen without having to go through a, a board process seems um, especially downtown. Too loose. Where we just yeah, don't it seems out. too loose. You know, the right kind of parking and access to buildings. Yeah. So so I guess. There, I have two thoughts on on this. We could go back to the way it was, um, uh, uh, just on just uh, eliminating that clause that we had included, or we could try and um, uh, create categories that have sort of similar um, similar impacts and wouldn't be wouldn't. Uh, um, would be reasonable to change from one use to another without um, significant changes in the need to come um, uh, for site plan review. Without a site plan review, but staff would still see. Maybe the it could even be minor, like a minor. Yeah, so that yeah. It could come I, yeah. to you guys, but it could be minor, so it's a little bit less. Um, or or uh, yeah, I don't know. Right? We yeah. we can we can make changes. We can we yeah, can I play with this. Yeah. Of questions sure. For clarification. So it's my understanding that you were reviewing one change of use to another change of use the first time around yes. so a retailer like a restaurant changing to another restaurant might come before you no okay so if it stayed within the restaurant category okay like and, yeah. and they didn't have any other changes to their to their building okay. or, their site. or their site and it okay. didn't meet any of the other sort of thresholds yeah. then um, you know they could change from one restaurant restaurant to another and yeah. go have at it right yeah. but if they changed from uh, well here perfect example from a restaurant to a fast food restaurant uh -huh. then yes even if they didn't change anything to their building so if they were in business A and they were a restaurant, but they changed to fast food restaurant, which is allowable in business A, they'd still come before you? Yes, even if they didn't make any changes because, no. bit, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was a deal, right? That's and, and, right, and that's where I think we can think about, well, you know, if they're not making any building change um, uh, changes, mm -hmm. but does the nature of their business then require some further review on their impacts to the to the community so if they're both allowable according to after we review this list within that same zoning district why because ostensibly you've given the approval in that zoning area because you've thought about both of those uses mm -hmm. being applicable in that area so if we're worried about a use then we put it through special permitting and that change would trigger a review. But if it's going, I'm just looking like, if it's going from a yes to a yes, well, within the same zoning area, why but, would it need a review? So a restaurant, right, they come in, um, the, we don't, when we do, when we do site plan review, it's, it's not purely the layout of the site. It's the impacts of that use on the, on the community. Right. Um, and so that's the part that we're not doing. Right, but I'm saying if we are nervous though, about a use's impacts on the community, yep. then you put the SPP into that zoning area. No, 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 yeah, we're not saying that we wouldn't allow them. I, I see no, what you're saying. Or I'm, that, saying I'm saying if, if, they, if, if you're going, let's just straight down column A, yeah. right? Yeah. Restaurant to fast food restaurant. 
just it says in, in in zoning district A, both of those are yes, right? So we've said those uses are allowable in that yeah. zoning district, which ostensibly means any any building, any place who has those that works. If we're nervous about a restaurant with a drive-through window in that same place, and you want to switch from a restaurant to a restaurant with a drive-through window, that goes from yes to special permitting process. So that would trigger a review. If you're going from two allowable uses in that zoning district, then ostensibly you've already given them kind of pre-approval for that use in that area. So if we have certain uses that we are nervous about having in those zoning districts, we give the we give them the, the special permit. And so therefore if you go from one approved use to a special permitting use, then you get to review it. I'm just I like, know I no, I understand what you're saying. I, I think there's um, um, just because so if 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 um, someone starts up a a use um, cigar store yeah but that's not allowable in that area smoking establishment well no it doesn't even matter what the use <laughs> is okay if someone starts up a use when when they come for site plan review we're we're not only right they're allowed to have that use we never say no you can't have you know you can't have a health club at this location that's never part of the discussion right in site plan review like you're allowed yes you are allowed a health club at this location that's you have a yes here but the two things we look at are the the physical site plan and the impacts of that use on the community and so when when typically a lot a, a lot of times what happens when they change when they when a when a when a building right changes use oftentimes they change the building anyhow and that triggers site and that triggers site plan review like, but not you, always like it, are you coming across a lot of examples where you wish we had done a review for something i'm uh, well i'm seeing a lot right there's things that change and i'm surprised that we don't have that but then when i look at this when i look at this like mm, Someone could open up a uh, oh animal hospital. Perfect example. No, 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 no. no. This is real, right? Yeah, it's very right. That that we is, have an yes. animal hospital in downtown do. Reading, right? That's correct. Um, and it, it, nothing's wrong with that, right? You and don't even know it's there. You hardly know it's there. But, but if 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 and it looks it it pretty much looks like, like a dental office. A dental office, yeah. But wouldn't if if they then move to um, to another building in town that used to be a restaurant? I would think that their neighbors, whoever, whoever um, are abutting that animal hospital, would want some public process that says, "Well, it used to be a restaurant, and now it's an animal hospital." I think if yeah, I mean because I, they have be, they they used to be or it, what it was a bank and now it's <laughs> dogs and yeah. uh, and um, right now n n there's no process yeah they go in there. there what's that I had a few thoughts sure so when you're looking at a table of uses just generally you make certain assumptions about different categories and um, in what I mean by that it is say in the service uses you want to include all different kinds of food restaurants mm -hmm. restaurants with the drive through fast food restaurants bars or taverns whatever the case may be you assume a certain level of activity around those a certain level of parking around those things a certain like layout and conceptual idea if i were a restaurant but i want a fast food component or I wanted to turn over to be a fast food place because I'm changing with the market, I think I would be deterred from doing that and even doing business in town if I had to come before the board and that category was allowed under the service uses in your table. So 
um, I would just caution that if you did want to, I think it makes more sense to re to restructure your table of uses so you have like uses yeah, with like right. Uses. Yeah, and that's what I was saying is right. is we could do this two ways. We could yeah. either we could either go back to the way it was where every single use, if you change use, you have to, yeah. or try and try and categorize the uses in ways that are are have. Or have those similar assumptions and externalities. Yeah. I think, I think uh, that to makes the greatest sense that many towns do it that yeah. way. Yeah. Right. And, and we, I think we got sort of got away from that <laughs> yeah. um, because these, the, the list is, especially this business and service use list is pretty broad. It's like a junkyard. And yeah. Um, um, funeral, I could see, like, to your point though, like, I could allowed. see, like, where we allow funeral establishment. And so if, like, uh, you know, another use in town were to t turn into a funeral establishment, like, you know, th I guess in theory there would be changes that would happen probably to the building and to the site that would trip site plan review, but like, maybe not. And that's a completely different type of use, like, right. with, yes. you know. Yes. Right. <laughs> so I totally, totally hear what you're so I guess, yeah, I mean, I think that we're on the same so, page yeah. of trying to yeah. say, if there are category uses of which the impacts slightly different are the same enough that you can go within those mm -hmm. without tripping a review. And then there are others that we say those have additional externalities to them, like a funeral home, <laughs> that may not have the same type of traffic. Mm -hmm. To a dentist. Yep. Right. right. So, I mean, yeah. so we I, the, the, the interesting thing is is you know when when we got the chiropractor from downtown and i was like why didn't pda have to come in when they moved it from the the restaurant to the dental associates so arguing against myself you know? right yeah so but yeah um keep going so that's one thing i think that that's um right that's sort of the the bigger picture thing that we ought to be thinking about when we look at this. Um, and the other thing that I was going to say is that I would like to, at, at least in the short run, um, avoid sort of some discussion on the industrial district um, because there are, right, the um, uh, town staff and others in town have been working on some different concepts for that industrial district. And until we sort of have a, a, a we're all on the same page in terms of what that vision is for that. I think it probably isn't worth um, the the effort or the discussion time for that, to zone. Go for that zone. I was going to say, because uh, yeah. the one thing I did notice is the industrial uses list is very outdated and yeah. needs to mm -hmm. be thought through. Yeah. 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 Um, and um, and uh, sort of on that, we do want to. Right, so there's there's a, a, a some different vision for that area, and um, Julie and I were talking about you know how to how do we incorporate how do how does this board um, sort of understand what's being discussed and um, right. Yeah. I mean, it's not worth it to go through this list without understanding what some of those implications are. Like right. 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 Add it's, things, delete right. things. Right. And so like that's why that. I want to put that put that to the side until we have until we have a better understanding of where we're going and where we're going yeah. yeah um so do you want me to talk about that a little bit sure okay sure. so um did any of you happen to watch the select board meeting from um i think it was september 24th we had a present the select board had a presentation by gamble associates um who's an urban design uh, firm out of cambridge that we acquired through a housing choice grant um, to do a study, you know, feasibility study and like a redesign um, concept of the east, what we're calling the Eastern Gateway, which is like the Walker's Brook, you know, Ash Street kind of triangle. Um, and so they focused their, you know, first kind of take on it on the on what we're calling the yard, which is the area where the DPW and the um, RMLD yes. building are and like the Rain Corporation and so it's like another little triangle within the bigger triangle. Um, the green triangle. So yeah, we have like the big green triangle. Mm -hmm. the yeah, we're up the GIS here. Carved like the pizza into a thinner slice. <laughs> um, so this area is what they focus on. Eric, 
So this is kind of the Eastern Gateway area to 128, and then Ash Street up here. Uh, the focus area for Gamble Associates, urban, I hesitate on urban using that word, but redesign or conceptual design is from the train tracks down to this right, Ash Street kind of wedge. Um, and there's a public meeting that is happening at the Economic Development Forum where Gamble Associates will be presenting what they presented at the Select Board again on October 23rd at the library um, from 6.30 to 9 p.m. And that's a good opportunity for this board to attend if you're available. And if not, there will be other opportunities on um, Specifically, we're trying to meet with Ash Street neighbors um, just in case families are out trick or treating that night. We want to make sure that we're reaching out to all the neighbors in different ways. So we'll have a couple of different public meeting forums um, that are specifically targeted to neighborhoods. But that's another opportunity for the wider public to get together at that um, October 23rd Economic Development Summit. What time did you say? 6:30 to 9. Library. Mm -hmm. At the library. Can you get a um get an event added to the town page yes. that you can share, please. Thank you. Um, wanted to make sure that we invited the neighbors ahead of publicizing too widely. Um, so my goal tomorrow is to get up on the town page and to notify the boards and to advertise more broadly tomorrow. So there'll be a presentation by Campbell Associates and also another presentation by Green International, who's looking at a comprehensive corridor analysis of like the Walkers Brook, um, Washington Street, Village Street, John Street, uh, New Crossing Road, Ash Street, the, the worst intersection in the world, um, <laughs> as we like to call it, um, with this idea that, you know, that area is go going to change and probably include a lot more um, be a little more utilized um, and redeveloped and so you know thinking about like not just the traffic that's there today but future um, traffic and maybe some uh, concepts for redesigning some of those intersections that came out of actually the Eaton Lake View Ford View process um, so if you need more information about those two initiatives um, and to talk to your neighbors since I'm on Ash Street yes yeah. I'd like Yes, uh, condense what all that just meant. Um, the, would you mind showing them quickly the economic development page where all that information lives? Um, so on the town's website, there's an economic development button actually on the home page. And then on the left hand side, Eastern Gateway Economic Development and Planning Initiatives. It's the fourth button down, and it gives you all the background about the economic development action plan what the goals are for redevelopment in this particular area with a map of that 2020 vision that has been talked about for a number of years now along with our summaries of what we just talked about the Eastern Gateway Urban Design in addition to the Green International um, project that's happening now. So for more information, take a look there and I'm happy to talk to you when I want to. That's fine, thank you. So I do think it makes sense to talk about the industrial district like a little bit further down the road yeah. um, as we get into the more technical aspects of what, what it is we're talking about here. Um, I just wanted to highlight, like when I went through this originally, I just highlighted some things that I wanted to be comprehensive, um, you know, and, and sort of start the conversation and get you thinking about what we should maybe allow in a different way and, you know, additional uses we might want to think about considering. Um, so. Um, so it's 9.44, um, it's been half an hour, or Sorry? it's been a half an hour or less. Yeah, do you want to? Sure. sure. Um, well, so what do you want to talk about? Uh, Can you going through this? Well, do you have any sort of big so high level thoughts or did, did anyone else? What do you mean by high level? Um, so, right, there, there's lots of, I'm going to say, um, l uh, particular focused items we could talk about. Right. Um, uh, I, I 
talked about sort of the organization a little bit. Um, do you think you highlight a lot about the definitions? Yep. Um, do you um, do you think that we need to have definitions on all those? Not on um, all of them. Um, I. But. Or do we you know, have I any? I mean, honestly, like at some point, and it probably isn't ready for tonight. But at some point, we should go through and we should. We should talk about the uses and do we do I mean, we that's need where this like, use in the table? Yeah. Do yeah. we and if we do need it, do we need to read like expand the definition of it? Yeah. You know, kind of just go through one by one. And yep. we have mining in our zoning table. We have junkyard. We have um, there's probably a reason for many of these things, um, but they might not need to remain. Um, so um, these terms are outdated. Yeah. Right. I wouldn't take my promise on it. Right. <laughs> Good point. Are you know? Yeah. That we're sitting on a bed of natural resources. <laughs> we should be tapping into it. It would be a spike hole. Like a spike hole. <laughs> I mean, um, there's there's a handful of uses that are like no across the board. Like, do they need to be in the chart, or can they just be like these uses are not permitted? Well, that's where I need to look up that question about um, no. <laughs> whether if it's yeah. not permitted, it's prohibited, um, because we would want to need to, we would need to know that. And I'm assuming if we make changes, so like I'm looking at. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I lost it. Um, it was indoor recreation it seems to be not permanent which seems silly in these day and age of like indoor mm -hmm. games and stuff so we were to say we're, we recommend that a no be changed to a yes I'm assuming all that then goes to zoning and then the town board or how does this work what do you mean Can you talk about the process the uh, regulatory process or the approval I mean, I, I, when we go through this, are we going to go through and, and make some decisions about what we recommend to be changed and same thing, kind of go for March town mm -hmm. meeting type and of thing? That, well, yeah, that doesn't go to, that's that's this board. So we don't need to go back to zoning. ZBA, you're saying to ZBA, yeah. no. no. Sort of we make the rules meeting. and they enforce it. We go to town meeting to right. get mm -hmm. approval. Right. And, and we do loop the ZBA in internally yeah. when we're making changes to the zoning bylaw to get their feedback before we put it in the warrant. Um, you know, they are part of the process, but it's not like an official appearance before them necessarily. Um, so th this is, you know, you guys can just yeah. have at this. Like this is, you know. So, um, so let's, right, we don't, um, I'm gonna say, right, we don't wanna necessarily touch the industrial uses category right now but I we think should look I mean, some of those are not industrial no, 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 uses. No, right we so need to prioritize yeah. we, we need to prioritize a lot of those industrial uses are also going to we'll have that conversation about what even industrial land do we have um, to, to use some of those so if we're going to uh, prioritize because we're not getting up through this tonight I would push that to the I'm, to the I'm end gonna disagree yeah because I've been dealing with clients that are looking for exactly these yeah. spaces every town except this one all right so let's head, put that on and because I mean, because, thing. because like, I was thinking I, about, yeah. I'll say right I'll say is that maybe some of these are exactly I didn't necessarily want to get into this but exactly the spaces that we're looking to redevelop in a different way with the with the um, Eastern Gateway. So maybe we do want to have this conversation now, so that we are informed of what this board thinks of um, you know other uses of that space. I, I would rather have it do the go the other way and see what came up first, and then see what we're what we're what we may or may not be able to accommodate um, when we give up that space um, to housing or some other use. You can always start with some of like the obvious ones, like the low-hanging fruit. So if Just, there's something yes. in your nick that you're like, the clients you work with who are looking for spaces, it's something we don't allow. Like I don't can, understand why computer you know, services is not allowed, but life science facilities, research yeah. and development facilities, yeah. those are all just laboratories. You know, they're just little small incubator type spaces, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and they're not the manufacturing facilities which need 100,000 square feet. These are 15,000, 20,000 square feet. There might be four of them, but. But so one thing I can, there's a few ways we can do this. Um, what do we get continued today? 230 something Main Street? 
a four-story building they originally designed, you could fit four little, four little incubators. Yeah, or I'm just so like, like I a guess a I'll say I, I remember having this conversation the last time we picked up this is that really that like a lot of those uses, we um, right I I think. Uh, I thought that we there was sort of some lack of um, agreement on exactly what those were defined as and what those what those were. How and long ago the, was that conversation? I don't remember it. Industrial uses in particular? Uh, life sciences facilities, research and development facilities, oh, okay. um, uh, well, like communication those aren't facilities. Necessarily that industrial. Not at all. In my no, I mean, but our industrial site, our industrial space isn't very industrial. Right, anyway, so like the so. whole idea and nature right. of what I mean, is industrial not. is evolving. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah. And so, broadly, talking about the Eastern Gateway presentation stuff and whether or not to dive into industrial uses, I would, I would say I, I recognize that you don't have the level of information because right. seeing that yes. presentation. Broadly, what that urban design vision kind of thing is, is not really definitively making decisions about um, this particular type of use in one location versus another on that triangle, but really thinking very, very broadly and being open-minded to a mix of uses that keeps in mind the current the current property mm. owners and uses on those parcels as is. So uh, with incremental changes over time, whatever that might look like. So I don't think that presentation will be so out of the water that it will prohibit you from being able to have a conversation about it. industrial uses generally. But you should also make that determination for yourselves when you um, get there. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't show you that. Yeah, I'm in a location right now. No, no, no. No, it's not. Yeah. Like, um, we'll get there. Um, and, and just on on one of those categories, publishing and printing. Yeah. They're currently doing that at Staples, so right. you can't say no. Well, it says yes in industrial, which is where Staples is located. So, I mean, what scale? What is this whole right. thing? Because that would be, to me, that's that's that's, that's retail, not, well, right? Well, but that's it, what publishing and printing is right now, and that's the that's right, what I'm saying. Like, like publishing and printing right now are not, 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 not yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. although they are they, they, they are down the street here at the Times Chronicle, right? <laughs> uh, right? They still do that. <laughs> ching ching ching. Right. We're talking about business A, right? So it was worth it. How big of a press are you going to get into business A? I don't know. It's going to be you know strip letters. But <laughs> but I think right. But that's this, what I'm saying. Like so, why does it say no right now? Which exactly. That's should, why. Yeah. Should say this yes. conversation. The problem here in all of these uses is that is is really understand. Yeah. Un, uh, sort of what we mean by that yes, and what exactly. they. And, and what that is. And does that make a distinction of heavy publishing and heavy industrial publishing? The first step is really defining them and then recategorizing them. Um, yeah. yeah. And then figuring out where we would allow them. So um, I feel like this is, I'm just, I'm, I'm, it, I need time to like fuss. Yeah. You yeah. Know? yeah. So, so there's a few ways we can do this. Like we've done in the past there's with other. There's 15 there. With where? In the industrial, industrial there's only 15. I bet you we could cut that and, you know, and only take a third of those and try to redefine them and put them somewhere else if we had to. Yeah. Um, so, no, it's okay. I just, I'm um, trying to, like, think about the process going forward. So, um, like, in the past, you know, we've done, like, the little one person from the board will work with me, you know, and then we'll come back and kind of present where we are. Or, you know, you can each, I can send the Word version, and you can each go through and kind of add your track changes to it, you know, one by one. Um, or you can just look, like, look at it and send me an email with your feedback. Um, or, you know, we can take it and we can look at it and take your feedback from tonight and come back to you with some ideas. Um, um, how about this for a thought? It, because I think a lot of this really all depends on on um, what we define these mm -hmm. 
as, um, and um, could I suggest, I mean, and some of the other ones, like I think that, you know, like if we take the discussion like on restaurant with drive through window, um, I, right, we can have that discussion and we can solve that and sort of figure that out in, you know, some night, you know. Um, but I think some of these, these other ones, if we could at least get, maybe you, you all, staff can do, to, can find a definition, maybe that other, other communities use, and then we can then have that discussion. Is that the right def, or is are those definitions? Are we missing something? Um, does they do they cover it? And then we can have the conversation about how does it fit. Mm -hmm. But I think that probably making sure that we're all talking about the same thing yep. before we spend too much time yep. is I would think be that's helpful. a good idea. Um, and so you see like staff taking the lead on that or do you? Uh, I, th I, I would uh, recommend doing that because we have knowledge yeah. and can reach out to other cities yeah. and towns yeah. and be yeah. able to find definitions that way. Yeah. And, and then we, we also have some industry knowledge and can reach out to specific industries to ask for feedback to make sure that what is in line with what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. But just so on to your drive through yeah. one, I do think that each one of us kind of coming up with our low hanging fruit talking points. Yeah. Right. Yes. The, of looking through these and A, kind of pulling things like tourist or trailer camp out. Or right. you know, but just making service, service might be something that would be attractive. Correct, because of our location. Correct, definitely. Right. Yeah. Or yeah, and so kind of pulling out some ones that basically it's a talk. Like here's a discussion point about a use overall, and yeah. and then so uh, like those, the in and the out ones type of situation. Whereas I think the ones with the definitions are pr particularly in that industrial use pack. We can't figure out the yes or the no's until we know what's in it. What are we talking about? Yes. Yeah. 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 So do you all want to take a look at it and kind of shoot us an email with like your, you know, your top three, like this needs to be fixed or your top five? Uh, there isn't any. Um, I had a laundromat <coughs> come in limousine service. It's, it's, there's um, short term rental of motor vehicles. And then the used car parking lot. In that category, I would think we don't have any automobile dealerships in town. We have we have rental. So we'll take a two strong right. approach to this. Staff will do some research on definitions in the behind the scenes, and you guys can take a look and kind of give some you know initial thoughts about the glaring things that we should um, maybe relocate. Can you mm -hmm. give me the quick, so business A versus business B is which? Business B is downtown. Okay, and, and business A the downtown is downtown Street. Overlay district. And then business A is primarily along South Main Street. There's a little pocket of it in the northern section of town, and there's a little pocket in the east and the west, actually. There. Um, Would it be helpful for staff to also take a look at some of these things? Yes. In addition to if finding definitions to also group some of these things together maybe a little bit differently from how they're laid out now as a suggestion for next time yeah i mean i think right first is is def on some some of these right categorizing is going to be easier yeah. some of them you know really requires the mm -hmm. the definition so to the degree that you can take a shot at both that's great yeah um and then um, uh, the other thing, uh, Julie, you said you were going to do was um, find out about the, um, the if it's, every, if it's not specifically like included. Discussed, yeah. is it permitted? Yes. Yeah. Um, I will look into that. I have not encountered that in my past, but um, it's definitely possible. Can I throw a monkey wrench into all this? Mm -hmm. No, I do. Do we want to include intensity? For example, a printing press of, say, more than 50,000 square feet may be only allowed in the industrial. A printing publishing of 20,000 square feet or less might be appropriate for business B. I would 
good to just refraining from that and if you feel like a particular type of use may have different levels of intensity depending on sizes or use, you may want to have a special permit process for this board to understand what those parameters might be so you can regulate them individually. Yeah, that could always be like the SPP. Yeah. Okay. For particularly yeah. difficult or yeah. more challenging types of things. So you can really get into the nuanced pieces of each one of those types of projects. Right. I would agree. By, by getting too detailed into you fit in 10,000 or you fit in 20,000, sometimes you miss an opportunity or create more of a burden when you have like a lab coming to town that's going to be great and it's 15,000 square feet, but you're in between the 10 and 20 that you're regulating. Right. And it can, if we're too prescriptive, we can be limiting, you know, creativity, flexibility, something that would, might really be good for the town. And I was thinking more of it for perhaps residential where you could have an attorney's office or a small dentist office. As long as you say, you know, yeah, as long as you've only got one or two dentists on staff or the staff is only three attorneys and a, one support person type of deal. That's when you say you'd have, you'd allow that, that type of use as a special permit in that particular category in, a, your, in your residential use. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm only one fifth of the board. <laughs> At least that's been. Nice. And technically, I don't get to vote most of the time. <laughs> I think actually now, until we have a sixth member, you can. Yeah. Correct. But once All we get time. another member, yeah. I'm back to the sidelines. Oh. Um. Should we talk about the design guidelines real quick? We really like think we're very close to getting there. Sure. They are on the agenda, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I was like, um, okay, so that you looking for? We are pretty much, well, any feedback, we're open, welcome to any feedback, but we are pretty much, we think, done. Um, Andrew and I went through and we, looked at all your feedback and all we went through all the outstanding comments from the last version. Um, what else did we do? Um, we tried to make sure the wording aligned throughout the yep. bylaw, adjacent versus neighboring versus abutting, adjoining versus adjoining. abutting. <laughs> Um, so we tried to fix all of those issues that we could find, and I think a lot of it now is almost housekeeping. Did you have a chance to look at it on the drive? Um, do you agree with our statement that the last remaining things are mostly housekeeping? Yeah, I didn't see anything. There is one, still one question about, um, so most of the uh, things that we added were in the last section, section 10, the district edges and transitional areas. Um, and based on some feedback we got, we, throughout the design guidelines, we started referring to adjacent residential properties as uh, single family, two family, or three family. Um, and then I had also a category. So in the instance that um, I had put a definition together where you had certain conditions when you were planning like a residential neighborhood, which I was defining as two or more residential structures. So that like the one remaining so there's like a little bit of a distinction there, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, um, and I didn't know if that distinction is just adding. Like at this point now that we've expanded to say that to offer protections for those two family, three family, single family, if we still need that residential neighborhood definition, or if that's just like adding another layer of complexity um, to the conversation that may not really be needed. Is 
replication? Was that the intent there? So there's a couple instances. Um, let's go down to where it is. Uh, it's probably not going to be readable. Uh, this can be this can yeah, make, make it a little bigger. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to define, we were trying to define like different conditions that could happen. Um, and based on like what a proposed development would be abutting, whether they would be at a district edge or in a transitional area or abutting a residential neighborhood. Um, and then we have these like kind of if then statements. Um, am I getting there? Julie, can we just, sorry, I, I feel concerned that that definition of only two becoming a neighborhood. Yeah, so we had talked about that. Like, I, I, uh, should we just, is it too little? It's way too little, and it's going to be. Do, but we might not even need it. I think we might not even need it. It's just, it's, what it is, is it's going to be used in too many situations to define abutting. I mean, there's practically nothing in this town that's not abutting. Well, we're talking about the downtown Smart Growth District. Understood. Right. But so two buildings is going to exclude. So this is actually to, to give you guys more leverage because in almost every other instance in the design guidelines, because of feedback we received, we offer up protections for even just one abutting single family structure. So there was a, there were a couple instances where I thought like really if the design of this redevelopment may not want to necessarily I mean do we use the residential design. neighborhood enough in the rest of the document to protect against it being not just one house every single time. Mm -hmm. I just I, I feel as if keeping the definition so small, all of the rest of the work isn't going to do anything because it's going to be so challenging for any developer to come in. To so I thought we, so I totally hear what you're saying. And I, the definition is actually smaller if you look at everything else where it's like you could be abutting one single family or one two family or one three family structure and you need to make these accommodations. Um, which kind of obviates the need in some ways for the residential neighborhood definition. Um, but we had kind of agreed, I thought, that that was okay. That that's where we ended up. That's where we ended up after many, many, many conversations about this. I totally hear what you're saying, though. Okay. I mean, I just... going to make it more challenging. All of it. Right. And it's going to make it less attractive. So I think well, that there is, the way the that they're worded, place. there is some well, flexibility. The more strict guideline was in place and worked several times. Sorry, say that again. The yeah. uh, stricter guideline has been in place since inception. Which one? Which which that current smart growth? The current smart growth. The residential. The definition of that residential. Single residential. Property. We had it. We it was kind of discussed, talked about, more vaguely, and we've made it more specific to say that even when you're abutting like a single family, certain protections need to be offered. I thought you said you changed it to two. No, so I still have the definition where I'm talking about a group of two, but I feel like it's probably not really necessary because it's not that different than what we're already talking about. I had originally defined residential neighborhoods two or more because we didn't have like language that really addressed like a, a redevelopment abutting residential uses. Um, and then neighborhood is a really squishy term. Um, I'm, with, I'm with you, but it's certainly not two and, houses. And it might have even, I might have even had it at three or more, and we went down to two because of feedback we got. I don't 
remember. But it just this feels like a lot of consequences. And I think the language, like if you read through it, I think it's still like flexible enough that it might not have like a markedly different impact than the conversations you guys had with like right. the Gold Street project developer, like you work that out through the process. Right, but we, the, the backstop for those conversations had to do with the, um, oh, I can't, like the grandfathered uses, the fact that it was a commercial zone. It is, right. And that's what the backstop was. And so the residential was always saying, those have been there for a long time, but the actual zoned use is not residential. Right, and right. That's how that's we right. were able to, to work right. with that. And so this is giving one residence much bigger power than that backstop. Right. Because we talked about like abutting residential districts and really the only the entire district is business, right? So there's some like, pre existing non conforming residential uses. So but like, it didn't really change. No. It, all it was was, was mixed discussion commercial points. Commercial so residential. The, no, no, no. No. The residents came in thinking that they were abutting a residential district. Right. And so the conversation was really just to inform them that it wasn't a residential district. There were just residences there. That's so what I'm knew, saying. They were interpreting it as a residential district. And that's exactly what I'm saying. And so by, by writing it this were. way and giving a stronger definition to a residential neighborhood, that distinction between residential neighborhood versus residential district becomes weaker. It's really, it's really actually now we just say residential use. So like, it's right. there is no resident. Yeah, so there is no. It doesn't. It doesn't even matter, right? It's the residential. It's the abutting residential use. So that, that will take precedence over taking. The, yeah. Right. That, so before right. we could say, well, you're not. A, this isn't a residential district that you're abutting, right. and the parameters and the, you know, the design standards were based on abutting a residential district. Correct. Right. right. And most. Like the and properties that are redeveloped in the downtown smart which is, do not abut a residential district for the most part, correct? Um, unless they're on the edges. And so, and so, really, I guess the way that I have, have read this is and sort of understood it is that, you know, we've always um, considered the impacts to abutting residential yes. uses um, and worked through with them. Uh, um, to minimize those impacts and so so I, I really don't th I think this um, that this sort of puts in that the, the um, puts it in writing puts it in writing things that right. things that we're going we were we were typically doing anyhow no. um, and so I guess that's really the challenge is 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 reading through that and seeing whether there's anything in there that understanding that um, that these guidelines are now applying to you know uh, um, taking into account every residential abutter and whether that's um, you know whether that's going too far or whether that's just sort of the what we've done anyways um, because I, I I sort of feel like that's what we've done. We've right, and the, the feedback nine that times you got, out of ten is what we've done anyways. And some of the feedback that you got was that it needs to be in writing and needs to have teeth. It needs to be enforceable. If it's just what your practice today, like a different board down the road might not have the same practice, and and that's the protections are not you know official or real if they're not in in writing. Um, and so then that's what that's where the question arises, like. Um, if you think it's too much to offer protections for every single abutting that's single where gonna get residential there. structure, that's the issue. we could have a definition of like residential neighborhood that kind of talks about a cluster of residential structures. Um, I just think you basically just swept everything over. If you've got anything that's a, that's abutting a residential use, there's practically but nothing look, unless you're abutting the train tracks. You're right, but look, <laughs> look I, I guess reread that okay. with the protections that are in there yeah and and then let's let's see whether those are those um the, where we are right and whether 
whether that's a reasonable thing for any developer to do anyhow, um, right? Because I don't think that we're, we're di we, I don't, I guess I feel like, I don't think we would approve many developments that just ignored even okay. a single uh, residential We environment. wouldn't, but I just, I recall some of those contentious meetings. Yeah. And so I recall in contentious meetings. And so if we have something codified that tips the favor in either direction, it creates it so that it's basically like you're at a stalemate. And it makes it challenging for someone to come in and you know the purposes of this is to outline the conditions that can capture an area in order to allow the neighborhoods to change so that's the stalemate that I'm nervous about is if we're giving this such teeth that we've we, we stick it in time so the way that these are worded like in section 10 the kind of if then clauses that we decided to write we say basically if it's adjacent to a single family, two family, or three family residential use, then consideration shall be given for, and we say, you know, shadows, um, for, there's a, there's a number of different ones, but it's basically, they all say like, then consideration shall be given. So it's not like a hard and fast rule, but it's like a, they need to tell us how they've given consideration to these different things, and in some cases provide documentation to prove it. Um, but it's not like a, if you're adjacent to this, you can't do such and such a thing um, in most instances. And I think that the reason that you at one point felt comfortable expanding it to say, you know, single family, two family, three family is because that is largely what you are already doing, um, like John said. So. Can we add a few things here? Sure. So I think it is beneficial to have this information written out for developers and for staff to be able to articulate what the board is already doing and expects. And then reading through this, you know, our developers, many of them are, are doing these things, and at least in my experiences in other communities, these are the kinds of things that developers automatically assume will be asked. And if the board doesn't ask, or if the town doesn't ask for its policies, it's kind of thought as like, well, missed opportunity they didn't ask so I think this is important to put down on paper because you are making these requests and so it's predictable to anyone doing business in town that these are the expectations I don't think that there are many things that are sticking out to me that seem so unruly that it would deter business um, and I think you'll get higher quality development when you lay down um, some ground rules that, and set expectations that way. Where I do get a little hesitant about um, risk is when developers are being uh, asked to provide studies that may not necessarily make sense for their context. Um, so like shadow studies may be like too much of a burden, but I don't think that would be unreasonable or unrealistic necessarily. Um, so that's kind of where I think that the board should actually ask at that point if you feel like you need additional information like traffic studies or whatever the case may be in context, you can ask for that additional information. No, it's, a balance. Not, it's a fine balance, right? I, 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 guess, I guess the key factor is your word consideration and guidelines. Yeah. These are not zoning regulations these are guidelines and I think that's the key factor these are enforceable guidelines but they are so that's okay but so then yeah. I, don't know, I feel part. like we're forgetting our battle scars so mm -hmm. well look at 467 Main Street there's two residences right behind it mm -hmm. which one is that sorry that's the old Sunoco station yeah that's already pretty much up and ready to be sealed yeah so, and that didn't have the battle scars. Right, because it was on Main Street and it didn't have the same. Well, it's just that the people impacted weren't as vocal. You're gonna get vocal people no matter what, whether it's one individual or a series of four or five. Right. Well, we have an absentee landlord on that one that's right behind. That's right, the, the tenants did count, I remember that. Yeah, they, yeah, they did. 
you can also have the uh, the Johnsons in the other one. Okay, I, I think I think it's fine. I think I think the definition of the residential district was helpful in setting some parameters on what was allowable and what wasn't, versus this, which I think creates something stronger than than that for this very confusing area of the downtown smart growth I think that's my like just focusing on that because it's got history and it's got tiny little streets and it's you know what I mean like there's just a lot to it that I just don't want to get us to a stalemate where everyone is right it says this I get to do this it says that I also get to do that and then we're stuck yeah. Oh. Do you guys want to give it one more review and then come back and um, see how you feel after yeah. like looking at it again? Okay. All right. My only request is if you can um, be consistent with the language for the one and two to three families. Mm -hmm. Am I not? I think even you noted a couple of places where you said, should we do it this way or that way? Oh, I did. Okay. I mean, I guess, I guess, Aaron, is there, you know, can we get some feedback from the private sector on things like this to see, does this seem reasonable. applicable and reasonable? I can think through more about my experience as a, you know, Honestly, I think it's helpful to have um, some set parameters and, you know, this this board will and does have special conditions based on every circumstance. And the more you're upfront about, if you're consistent with those, it, it makes sense to put those down in writing and say that these are the expectations that we have as part of doing business in town. Um, and I'm happy to work with Julie on taking a look at the language more clearly and shopping that around a little bit. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it'd be interesting to actually have someone have to read this and their first proposal comes in having oh, yeah. considered these things That's, as opposed to making them you know, go back learn, to the drawing board. We learn on every, all of us learn on every project. And every circumstance is a little bit different and somebody's always pushing the envelope so much so that sometimes we don't even think about that possibility. <laughs> That's how we adapt and change. And so just, if we are going back, do we want to consider um, Mary Ellen's suggestion about green space in the design parameters? We have some stuff in there about like streetscape and public amenities. Um, We can definitely like read it with that lens, you know. Um. Yeah, I guess I I don't th I think the right. She brought up two th two different things. One is 100% lot coverage, um, and, and I uh, I think that's a whole different. Th mm -hmm. That's sort of out, I'm gonna say outside and different yeah. from this. Um, but um, it, and I guess even the setback specifically, although. We can, I th you know, let's let's look at how that is in here, um, and and see if we can, we can do that. Um, yeah. I mean, it's tough. I mean, it, yeah. In but, something like the Sunoco station, you set that back, you lose too much of the footprint. It doesn't work. And similarly, yeah. you know, too much of a kind of green space between the building and the sidewalk, and you lose the ability to have the mixed use make any sense. Mm -hmm. So. Having a 60 foot wide commercial, or I don't know how long, how wide is it? I mean, um, the, the entire commercial zone. I mean, it's only yes. so deep. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all, you, all, you can only do so much in yeah. that space. Yeah. And so, um, so, but, um, but point taken. And yeah, since we are going back, let's look at that. Look yeah. at that. Um, you know, the, the, I the, the other proposal was more interesting. Not clear cutting for subdivisions. Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, and I guess I guess not to not to ignore that, but um, but I, um, 
we right we have talked um, over the years about having to go back and look at the, our subdivision yep. um, regulations and, the list. and um, yeah <laughs> um, I do think though especially the ones like the project on Lowell Street that went through you know you guys and conservation you know they do have to cut some trees to put in a road and develop homes and I think you do a pretty good job of limiting the you know, limits of work and so does the Conservation Commission. They have a whole tree removal replacement policy. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm in favor of trees and saving as many trees as possible, too, but there is that, like, balance of, you know. On that smaller development where you're doing four or five houses plus a small road, unless they do some sort of cluster development where everything is sort of right at the beginning, you're just, you're not going to get... You're not going to be able to save a lot of the trees. You're right. You yeah. have to get clear of the roots for the foundation and the roadway. Right. So that's mm -hmm. just right. a lot of trees coming down. But if we had a larger lot and we somehow incentivized a smaller yep. cluster type development, then maybe we could save more of the lot. Right. And yeah, right. And that's exactly what we see: is these four or five lot developments. Yeah. Um, and so just enough room to just enough room to get everything in there, get the stormwater in there, um, get the road in there. Even though they, we are allowing the, you know, these yeah. s smaller and smaller roads. Right. It's just there's cramming more stuff in They're smaller just space. Trees, yeah. right? They yeah. got to take them out, put the road in, and they yeah. Do trees. yeah. But the trees they plant don't grow that big. Mm -hmm. I keep looking around and I'm going, okay, when I was a kid, the trees went 60 mm -hmm. feet high. They were huge. Today, they, after 20 years, they're barely 20 feet tall and barely anything. No, because, right, they, put the, they plant Bartlett pears that grow really quickly, small, and that's, just, that's yeah, 30 foot mm -hmm. tall. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. That's from our 40. No, but it was mark. good that I was, it was interesting that she brought that. Uh, uh, 100 years old. So, so that should be, very big yeah. we should talk about the, yeah. um, the subdivision. We should, yeah. Um, I just, I do question, like, how, this is not that it's a reason not to do it, but, you know, how much land is, is left. Well, you probably would have said the same thing 10 years ago. Um, and yeah. they keep coming and they keep coming. Out. They keep coming, so. Um, my experience yeah. in Danvers with subdivision regs, we were thinking about altering the regs to include multifamily or two-family units as well to just you know, use less land, essentially, mm -hmm. and still provide the same financial benefit. Well, accessory department's going to do much the same thing. Very similar. You've got a garage in the back that you're not using. Hello, that's the apartment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we could definitely look at that too. Because right, because every time that one comes in front of us, like we we say three or four times during the process, well, we you know we don't believe in this regulation, and we're giving oh, yeah. these so ten like, waivers, you know. Like, but also, it's like you don't want to like giving waivers is your negotiating power too right. to get other things that you want. Right. So it's like we yeah. need to meet in the middle on that. I agree. Um, I agree. And not just write the exact thing that we want. <laughs> yep. Yep. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So you're saying this is not a perfect world, right? I don't know. I've never said it's a perfect world. No, <laughs> definitely not. I deal with zoning. <laughs> the only constant has changed. Exactly. All right. Well, so this was a good conversation. I think we have our work cut out for us. Um, and we're all really busy, but I hope you can make it on the 23rd. And I hope you have a chance to review the use table and provide some feedback before the next meeting. Can you, can you send the, the Word doc? Yeah, I'll send the Word doc. Um, and I'll send it with a reminder. I'll send the information on the Economic oh, Forum. Mm -hmm. And if you have any specific questions or need more information, I'm available. Quiet tonight. I know. She's absorbing. <laughs> <laughs> Did you move to a new place already? I did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I probably moved in down the street this weekend, so. Um, we're going to hold on to the meeting minutes. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. This Next one is time. a packet, right? No, I okay. just finished looking at them today. Right. Your point of getting through it, because Andrew said to read it. All right, so. Any other? Um, 
planning updates or other topics? Hmm. Oh, I think yeah. we've had we should mention the survey. You guys seen and or taken the reimagined Reading survey nope. that's out. We'll send that to you in our email. But we've Great. had over what twelve hundred responses? Thirteen hundred thirteen hundred responses. Why haven't we seen it? Uh, why didn't it just go up to It's been everywhere. Yeah. Here. Oh. Well, <laughs> it's not too late. It's not too late. I did mine yesterday. Oh, I, I did. I did. Mine. Where, did Where did this count go? Where did oh, they come from? Oh, uh, the running email. rant. I get maybe every other okay. email. My wife that one wasn't emailed to us. Right away. Oh, good. I get oh, three wasn't. emails yeah. from everything. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. I had to go find yeah, it. I didn't get the week. Week. It's on the website. That's mm -hmm. the best way to find it. So. It's a. It's a. It's a little buggy. <laughs> it is <laughs> survey. Oh, it's long. It but it's is. also buggy. Like it's it's like there's like. So, anything else? <laughs> I think this is enough. All right. <laughs> Unless there's something right. you're no, hoping no, on no, it. We no, can keep going. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Uh, motion? <laughs> motion to adjourn. adjourn. I was like, dismiss? Second. Good <laughs> 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 <laughs>